All right, good morning. You're very welcome to Friday's Off the Ball, 19th of April. Good Friday. We're kicking off Easter weekend. And as is the way things work in here, the big dogs, Jer and Owen, are away on holidays all week. So we've had to bring in a novelty aspect to Off the Ball AM for the last few days. A few stand-in presenters here or there. Today it's Neil Tracy, and we're going. We're teaming it up today because we have another Tracy here. Keen Tracy is alongside me. The dream team. The dream team. Different spelling of the surname, though. I'm the I'm the correct version. Is that what you say? The yeah, that's, version, I'm, yeah, I'm the, I'm the correct version. Yeah. Um, always A C E Y. Always. E A. Always E A C Y. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's how we're teaming it up today. Two Limerick people as well. Uh, so there is going to be a little bit of a focus on rugby this after or this morning. Um, looking forward to a big weekend, Keen. Yeah, I don't think the rugby can kind of come soon enough. It's been sort of such a strange week with the agenda has been just dominated by Israel Falau, Billy Vinopola, which has been disappointing because it's taken away from what is the biggest week of the, the club season. So yeah, the, the game tomorrow can come quick enough really. Yeah, um, you do have a story that we're going to get to uh, soon enough um, on a bit of team news from Munster as well. Just a reminder as well, we are streaming across all our social platforms this morning, live across Twitter on Periscope, also on YouTube and Facebook. Um, we do have a lot coming up this after uh, this morning. We'll just get it up on screen there in the next couple of minutes. We will be looking through the sports pages. Then at 8 o'clock, Alan Quinlan is going to join us uh, and we're going to talk through this weekend's Champions Cup Games. Munster in action again. Saracens tomorrow in commentary. Uh, in Coventry, that is going to be a commentary game on News Talk and Off the Ball tomorrow afternoon. Daniel Harris will join us at around half past eight to look ahead at the weekend's football. Big weekend tomorrow in the Premier League. Man City and Spurs going head to head just a couple of days after that incredible Champions League game at the Etihad Stadium. And also uh, Liverpool then with the chance probably to go back to the top of the table if Man City can overtake them on Saturday. Liverpool on Sunday they are away to Cardiff in desperate need of a win themselves after a very good three points against Brighton during the week, which has brought them very much back into the uh, into the survival mix. And also then as well from 8.45, we have a very long, uh, very long, very interesting piece from Andy Lee with Cahill O'Grady that we're looking forward to bringing you and all of that between now and half past nine. Up first though, it is the sports pages. Okay, so a lot to get through in the uh, sports pages this morning. Uh, first of all, on the back of the Irish Independent, the big story, clubs told stand up and fight. Club Players Association threatens strike action as anger grows with the GAA's top brass over fixture crisis. Uh, this is from Michael Verney saying that the Club Players Association could take the nuclear option and propose strike action over what they perceive as continued inaction from the GAA's top brass in their efforts to solve the current fixture crisis. Also there in the bottom left corner, you can see a little bit of a scoop from Keane and from Rory O'Connor as well, one of his colleagues in the Irish Independent. Earl set to miss Munster semi. Keith Earls is expected to be ruled out of the Champions Cup semi-final against Saracens tomorrow. Uh, he's been struggling with a thigh injury, missed the last couple of games and although it appeared that he trained uh, fully earlier in the week. It looks now like when the team is named at around 12 o'clock he is not going to be in it. Also as well, Waterford in limbo as Euro denial prompts owner exit fear. So the future of Waterford FC is very much up in the air at the moment after the FAI confirmed last night they would not be part of uh, the Irish representatives in the Europa League for next season. That's after they uh, they hadn't been in existence for three years so they wouldn't be eligible to play. Uh, what's in the examiner, Keane? Uh, yeah, the examiner lead with uh, Ronan O'Gara's uh, column tomorrow is possibly the most monster of scenarios, a dangerous underdog. It's a very good column actually, Ronan O'Gara going through the, the potential pitfalls for Munster. Um, on top they have Fond Farewell, retiring best, wants to finish career with World Cup glory and I suppose that's been a team throughout the papers this morning, lots of nice tributes to the Ireland captain who confirmed yesterday mm. that he's going to finish um, all rugby, I think it was probably expected but now we have the confirmed news. Uh, just other couple of bits of pieces, safe passage, Arsenal and Chelsea book semi-final tickets. Final four at Cruyff Derby would be the fairy tale Champions League climax. That would be pretty cool, I think. Uh, road to recovery. That was Richie one actually, I'd kind of forgotten about that over the last few days. Mm. It, that kind of just passed me by, the notion of Barca against Ajax. Yeah in the Champions League final Cruyff Derby that'd be that'd be pretty special oh yeah all the Premier League fans are the Liverpool and Spurs ones certainly wouldn't be happy <laughs> but yeah it'd be, it'd be, in fairness the two semi-finals sh should be class if mm. the quarter-finals are anything to go by um, 
a couple of other bits here. Road to recovery, Richie McCarthy, McCarthy vows Limerick career won't end like this. And Paul Rouse, the athletics club that shaped life in the Midlands. OK, on the back are the sports section of the Irish Times today. Emotional best to end his career after the World Cup. It's Rory Best's announcement yesterday and confirmation that he will retire fully from rugby after the World Cup in Japan this year. And class outfit to lose will be great challenge. That's what Luke McGrath says. Jerry Thornley is writing uh, there ahead of Leinster against Toulouse on Sunday. And also there on the far side, Falau case could turn on point of New South Wales law. So Israel Falau's potential challenge to his sacking could turn on whether his conduct occurred in New South Wales, a legal expert has said. We had uh, Jack Anderson on the show earlier in the week, I believe, to talk a little bit about that. And it looks like something that could carry on for a little while yet. Yeah, the Irish Daily Mail lead with in flying form. Delaney enjoys Germany trip as Chrysler deepens. I don't know if you saw the picture that was doing the rounds of John Delaney over, I think it was in Frankfurt. Sitting, yeah. Sitting down having a meal. It's in relation to that. Um, Philip Just Quinn, hold it up there towards the camera. Philip Quinn is writing that um, John Delaney may be on guarding leave, but that didn't stop him being a guest with the Leinster Football Association. So, um, yeah, this, the saga r rumbles on, I suppose, and I see in, in another story today that his... Um, his credit card was stopped as well for the FAI, so yeah, it rumbles on. London calling, Arsenal and Chelsea reach semis, and then Philip Lanigan is writing about the club for as well. Furious club players threaten revolt against GAA. Okay, on the back of the uh, Irish Daily Mirror, Potch, this is our destiny. Destiny, Fate and hard work can take us to Euro glory. That is uh, Mauricio Pochettino saying there's a sense of destiny driving Spurs' Champions League ambitions this season. And a few screen grabs also as well of, I don't know, did you see the video during the rounds yesterday of Pochettino's yeah. celebrations yeah, after the game? It, wasn't it? Giving it the, uh, the big balls, <laughs> the big balls uh, celebration. Um, so yeah, Pochettino going crazy in the Spurs dressing room after the win. Um, he was talking about just how much of a roller coaster of emotion that last minute or so was when, you know, we saw we all saw the video of Pep Guardiola doing the rounds where he thought they were through to the last four, and then VAR pulls it back, and likewise, then Pochettino was probably going through similar things just uh, at opposite times. It was a montage maker's dream, really, wasn't it? There were so many different clips. I mean, I, I don't know. Did you see the one um, about the City fan? He left just after the goal, so he didn't know. Oh that yeah. The bar. So like, <laughs> yeah. it was absolutely brilliant. Like you know, you, you can't make this stuff up. Um, the Irish Daily Star. Um, Pot just go, similar team there to what you had, Neil. Um, Alexander the Great in reference to Lacazette last night putting Arsenal through. And Carlo Kane is also writing about the player's body slams GEA. So pretty similar messages there in the Irish Daily Star. Yeah, and just a couple more to get through quickly here. Uh, this is in the Irish Sun this morning. Napoli nil, Arsenal won. Good luck, bad luck. Uh, Unai Joy marred by Rambo Blow. That's after Arsenal went through to the Europa League semi-finals. Uh, where they're going to take on Valencia now. Alex Lacazette's uh, brilliant free kick is what saw them over the line yesterday. It was 3 0 on aggregate in the end after a 1 0 win in Naples. Uh, Lacazette's free kick. The bad, uh, bad luck though, Aaron Ramsey uh, went off what looked like a hamstring injury. So who knows? It looked like a small tweak, but you'd never know. We might well have seen the last of, uh, last of um, Aaron Ramsey in an Arsenal shirt. Hopefully not though. Uh, be good to see him get a couple of games towards the end of the season. And also a small little piece there on the left-hand side, which we'll probably ask Daniel Harris about when we have him on the line later on. Uh, Ollie's Rage, this is an exclusive by Neil Custis. Oli Gunnar Solskjaer tore into Manchester United's flops after their Barcelona humiliation, accusing them of not giving 100%. Um, it seems like Solskjaer only, the ink is barely dry on the contract and the complications of being the permanent manager rather than the substitute teacher are starting to creep in. Yeah. And just, uh, oh, you have one yeah, more there. The Herald here, um, Klopp, forget about Messi. Pretty much easier said than done, really, I would suggest. Um, I think Klopp is saying that the focus is going to be on the next two Premier League games, which, again, it's going to be tough not to have one eye on Barcelona. Yeah, I'd imagine it's very tough. <laughs> yeah. um, Aidan Fitzmaurice here writing as well about Delaney not on FAI business, which is obviously in relation to the story we just talked about. And Richard Dunn, Pep now has mental block over Europe, which has been a very interesting talking point, I suppose, after the, the game during the week. And also finally then as well, uh, Canaries are close. This is on the back of the racing sport. Uh, Canaries are so close, but return to the big time. May have to wait for Norwich. Uh, 
may have to wait for Norwich. That's Norwich. Uh, if they win tonight against Sheffield Wednesday in the Championship, they could get promoted tomorrow automatically. That is if Sheffield United lose in their kickoff against Nottingham Forest. And also Spurs 20 to 21 to secure a final place. That is uh, just a short little story about how Spurs are narrow, narrow favourites uh, early on uh, ahead of the Champions League semi final with Ajax. We do have a couple of. Uh, uh, back pages from the UK papers. This is on the back of the... Is this the Guardian, Tommy? This is the back of the Guardian. Pochettino's great escape. Spurs manager feared massive uh, emotional toll of City defeat. And a picture there as well just of uh, Pedro scoring for Chelsea yesterday as they wrapped up uh, their uh, Europa League semi-final place. A similar picture of Pedro as well on the back page of of the Telegraph. Uh, my eyesight is not great at the moment. Should have brought the glasses this morning, actually. <laughs> uh, Blues Cruise, that's after Chelsea's 4-3 win yesterday against Slavia Prague. That sets up a semi-final against Eintracht Frankfurt. Now, uh, a couple of stories to get to. Uh, one that we just touched on there going through the back pages, Keen. that is of Keith Earls, mm. set to miss <coughs> Munster's semi-final against Saracens tomorrow. We... It's not 100% confirmed, but it's more or less confirmed that Joey Carberry is going to miss. We, we're kind of taking that as a given. Yeah. Um, it looked at the start of the week like Keith Earls was probably going to pull through. We got the impression that he trained fully on Monday. He'd sat out the last two games, was what we were told. It was just, just precautionary, uh, a bit of tightness in his tie. But it appears now when the team is named at about 12 o'clock, he's not going to be in it. Yeah, that's what, what do you know about it? That's the information I have. Obviously, we'll see at 12 o'clock when the team comes out. Um, I don't think he trained fully on Monday. I think he did the warm-up and was there for the pictures, for the snappers and things. But I don't think he actually completed the full full training session. And I suppose it goes, you know, Joe Schmidt never picks players if he can train in the early part of the week. And Keith Earls knows his body better than, than most pe people. We saw that during the Six Nations as well against England. Remember, he picked up the injury earlier on. and. Mm -hmm. He just wasn't the same player playing through it, but it's a, if it's confirmed, it's a, I think it's a massive loss for Munster. Like you said, already without Joey Carberry, their main attacking threat. Keith Earls has arguably been their best player this season. He's been in sensational form. We saw it against Edinburgh, how important he was in such a tight game, you know, to mix it up. Um, there's also doubts about Jean Klein. Um, now, he may play, but I mean, he, I think he has to play as well, especially when you're going up against the Saris pack who... You, you, you like your scrums, obviously, but you know what Sean Klein brings is the tight head mm -hmm. packing down there behind Jean yep. Ryan is absolutely crucial. Now, he, he may play, he probably will play, but I don't think he's 100% fit either. So that's big worries for Munster. Sarri's, he, missed, he missed the semi final two years ago. Yeah, and he. Uh, when they played Saracens. He's, he's been an incredible signing as well because he, he's a perfect foil for Tyburn. He allows Tyburn to get, get around and do what he wants. And when you look at Saris are getting their players back, Munster are losing a couple of theirs. It was already a tough ask. It's become even tougher. Who's coming in for Earls, are we expecting? I believe, uh, I believe Darren Sweetnam will probably start. So you'll have a back three of Darren Sweetnam, Andrew Conway and Mike Haley at fullback. Darren Sweetnam is having a very good season as well. I just think Keith Earls has been sort of out there on his own as the most outstanding Munster back three, and maybe even the most outstanding Irish back three player this year. Mm -hmm. And Tyler Blaindell, I, I heard a sniff of a rumour yesterday there might have been a knock going with him. Um, I, didn't hear, I didn't hear anything more of it. You didn't hear anything, though? No? no, well, I didn't, but that's not to say that's not true either. Right, I'll, uh, I'll put that one out. I'll uh, throw water on that one there now for now. Yeah, no, well, they, they, they certainly need him. Although JJ Hannon did play very well last mm -hmm. week against, against Benetton and actually Rona Gar is writing that he's almost become the forgotten man. But the stage is set for Tyler Blaindall now, isn't it? He's overcome his injuries. It's probably time to deliver now on that. Yeah, like a redemption day, I suppose, given uh, he had a frustrating outing two years ago when he played against Saracens. Now, before we get Alan Quinlan on the line, we'll come back to Keith Earls in a couple of minutes. Uh, one of the stories doing the rounds and most of the back pages as well, the Club Players Association threatening strike action as, I suppose, just the frustration with the GA over the fixture crisis continues. Uh, some very interesting lines here from a statement that was given out yesterday. Uh, this is from the Club Players Association uh, issued to members yesterday afternoon. It was the chairperson, Michal Brody and Secretary Michael Higgins, who detailed the frustration with the uh, GA uh, top brass at a lack of progress. We cannot say with certainty uh, that we are being listened to at management level, but we all know uh, players are listening. So we are now looking for action, not words. As GA members, we already know what we are, but we also know what we could be if our leadership can find the courage, the will and the foresight to move the decisively on fixtures. The proposed fixtures group 
properly constituted presents an opportunity for a real lasting legacy beyond a new manifesto published and a pro uh, promoted and promoted at a cost of the GA. If our GA is truly a place where we all belong, then we need action, not words. We stand ready, as we have been since 2017. We'll be in touch again soon to update you on the next steps, including possible escalation. Uh, it's an enormously frustrating time. Like I, I stopped playing uh, Gaelic games when I was probably about 15 or 16. So, like myself. Yeah, I, I, I can't really, I can't really put myself into the position that club players are in. But we do have a lot of people in the office here who play yeah. hurling, play football for their clubs at home, and just the frustration non-stop. Uh, I'm always hearing the frustration of them. Uh, this club month at the moment, April, it seems. Some counties follow it well, uh, give a good few games to their players. Some don't really follow it at all. And it's just that there doesn't seem to be any uniformity or continuity among any of the counties. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> even, even if you are getting a few games in April, so be it, you might not actually end up playing, playing another meaningful club match again for another few months. Yeah, it, it it seems like it's a constant saga between the, the, the players, the clubs aso the association. I mean, Philip Lanigan is writing here, the problem for the CPA is that a player's strike may go unnoticed as county championships look set to be delayed for months after the opening rounds are played during this month's club only window situation, which is clearly heightened a sense of frustration amongst club players. So like you said, it, it seems like every season, like yourself, I'm sort of outside of the GEA beat as well, but it seems like every season there's a bit of friction between them and that the club players aren't being held. I even saw on Twitter the other day, was it Kildare? Someone had played a game during the week and this is supposed to be the, mm -hmm. the club only month. So it's, there's clearly something broken along the line there, but how it's going to be resolved is beyond me anyway. Yeah, um, and even it kind of, you know, I remember last week Jerry Thornley was writing about the frustration of club, club mm -hmm. teams in rugby and I, I found it, there seems to be similar themes there where uh, the best players aren't getting the, you know, the the good, the really good academy players uh, for Munster, Leinster, Connacht and Ulster. They're not getting to play that much at all, whether it's for the Munster or Leinster A sides or anything like that. And also they're missing out then on the club action. And ultimately it's the clubs that are that are suffering, especially especially far out down the country. Yeah, and that's the that's the you know the bread and butter of you know Irish rugby. It's the the same with the GEA. You know that the club game is so important to what we do here. And yeah, like you said, the, the rugby situation is a weird one. They're having that you know the American Cup that the A teams are going over playing at the moment at an absolutely crucial time in the All Ireland League. So yeah, it's it's a bit. There's good parallels. They're actually similar. That the club players are the ones whose voice isn't being heard in in all of this at all. Yeah, that's, uh, that's your sports pages for the morning. We'll come back to a few more talking points a little bit later on. Uh, first, though, uh, Alan Quinlan's going to join us on Skype Live from Limerick next year on OTBM. First, though, here's Brian O'Driscoll on how he sees Munster getting on this weekend. Saracens are the team to beat in the, in the, in the tournament. Um, you know, if they get uh, Maccab Van Apola back this week, which is, um, there's a few question marks uh, around it, um, Owen Farrell will be back. Remember, he wasn't involved in the mm. quarterfinal demolition of, of Glasgow as of the birth of his child, of his first child. Um, so I, I, I just think that that has an is a mouthwatering prospect because Munster are going to be at their dogged best, um, and whether they'll be able to contain the firepower that um, Saris have or not, I, I'm not sure, but. It, it, you know, is, is their dogged best enough against Saracens? Because part of it mean, looks at Munster and some of the performances, their biggest performances in the Champions Cup this season, they haven't played particularly well for an hour, but mm. they've stuck in there mm. and then Keith Earls pops up with something mm. special. Can and, you stick in been, there for an and, hour and against been, Saracens? But I think that's been their problem in, in the semi-finals over the last couple of seasons, is that the gulf between quarter-final and semi-final, they've they've been put away. Mm. And But I think they're an improved side. Certainly, they were an improved side against Racing from the from the one uh, against Saracens the previous season. I do think they're, um, you know, they're, they'll be better for those experiences, but they're still going to have to produce their, you know, their very best. And I, I the firepower versus firepower, you, you back Saracens all day. Um, but you know, something about Munster in Europe, and if they can hang in there and stay with Saracens, uh, it's important not to concede early. Very interesting there when um, Brian mentioned how much, of a, how much of an X factor and how important Keith Earls yeah. might be tomorrow. Obviously, this was recorded yesterday with Nathan before we knew that uh, Earls was going to be missing out. Um, it's just... 
talk about timing. Yeah, I think a lot of the papers have actually rightfully, you know, highlighted how important Keeler's was going to be. But again, we'll see at 12 o'clock if it comes through. He might have made a miraculous recovery, but he would be a massive loss. Okay. Uh, Alan Quinlan is joining us live now from uh, God's Country, Limerick. <laughs> Alan, 11 years ago, you were part of a Munster team that beat Saracens in the Rico Arena to get through to a Heineken Cup final. I can't imagine you thought back then, though, that that would be the this would be the last time Munster would be getting there for at least eleven years. Six semi-final defeats since then. Um, it's been quite a while, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. There's been a lot of disappointments, Neil. Um, th some happy memories. I was thinking about that this morning. The Rico Arena. We were that was a nervy enough performance from us that day against a, a Saracen side who were we were fancy to beat. I think. Um, Against all the odds, they nearly beat us, and uh, we did. We underperformed that day, and um, it's back. They're back to Coventry again, and and unfortunately, as you said, Munster have had a fair few disappointments in semi-finals, losing six of them. I was just thinking about that in the last few days. Will will their luck change? Are they good enough to make it change? Um, I'm not sure. This is a, a game against. It's a completely different Saracen side who were overwhelming favourites. They average 28 points a game in the in the pool stage. It's the only side to win win all their pool games convincingly so the average four tries a game as well so you start thinking uh, it's a different scenario than back in 2008 um, but you know Munster have a pedigree it's their 14th semi-final and um, you know there's you just wonder will their luck change a little bit um, are they good enough is probably the, the more relevant question and uh, it's going to be a very very difficult game from given the possibility of, of Keith Earls being missing now on top of Joey Carberry not going to be available. Yeah, I was just going to say, like you mentioned, the uh, Munster's look potentially changing. It doesn't seem like it's going that way now over the last couple of days with uh, the news that Keith Earls is probably going to miss out. Like how much of a, like how big a blow is that going to be? We, we saw it against Edinburgh in the quarterfinal. Just two little snipes is all he got in pretty much the entire game. He was over for two tries. Like it, a full-on game-breaker is what Keith Earls is and... To have him absent, that is massive. Yeah, it is. It's it's usually disappointing for him if he if he doesn't play. Games like this, Neil, I think are are you know the small margins. You might get one or two line breaks. You might get a little opportunity, and and you think someone like Keith Earls is the person who will create that or or be on someone's shoulder if they make a line break and 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 get a score. Um, you know, I think it's. I think both sides are very strong defensively, so there might be the opportunities might be limited. Um, but you know he's a huge loss to, to to miss him, and I think there's a lot of pressure on Tyler Blendell to try and bring a big performance as well with Joey Carberry out. So you want kind of X factor players, players who can create something out of nothing in big cup games. And Keith Earls and Joey Carberry are two guys that unfortunately Munster can ill afford to lose, but. Um, their attacking game this year hasn't hasn't been hasn't been good enough. I don't think at times they were very good in Gloucester. I suppose in round in round five, um, the performance in Exeter in, in in round one was a real kind of show of steel and resilience and and passion. So they have the capability to go on there. I think the worry is where will the tries come from? Where will the scores come from? Yeah, and like you mentioned there, you alluded to Saracens, like an average of 34 points and four tries in a game. Munster's attacking problems, they have the, the lowest number of, the, the lowest average metres per game of any side in the in the competition, even aside from teams that didn't even get through to the quarterfinals or the semifinals. So how do they go about, on one hand, narrowing all that down on Saracens' side and pushing everything out on their own side and attack? I, I think for Munster to have any chance, they've got to frustrate Saracens, which is very difficult to do because they have so much power and so much quality throughout their team. So they've got a, you know, what's been good from this year is their defence. They've been the best defensive side in, in the pool stages. And um, so they've got to try and stay really, really connected in defence, not give up any soft scores and frustrate Saracens and, and maybe win a turnover or two from Tigborn, from Stander, from O'Mahony and get some energy and lifts out of that and, and play in the right areas and hope that they can they can force Saracens into a real dogfight and, and bring the intensity level up to a place maybe that Saracens may not be used to going. Um, they're used to being the dominant side in most games they play. They've only lost five games this season. 
some of those were in the in in, in the the premier they were in the premiership when they were missing a number of their internationals so they don't tend to lose games with with their full strength side so Munster have just got to be really really efficient they turned the ball over a number of times in that first half against Edinburgh and it nearly cost them so they've got to be so much better they'll know that themselves um, I'm sure they've worked on it in the last few weeks uh, but they've just got to deliver a, a ace nine possibly some tens out of 10 performances for the players and, and hope that they can they can just turn the, the tide a little bit on Saracens and, and put some pressure on them. But it's hard to see it happening, Neil. Um, I know you want to see it happen. Keen wants to see it happen. I want to see it happen. But, um, we, we, we want to see it happen for the, the benefit of Irish rugby, Alan. No, no, okay. no parochial biases or anything like that. I'll, I'll for the benefit of Irish that. rugby. More How good would it be to have a, a, a Leinster Munster final? It'd be incredible. Absolutely. And, uh, um, I just think, look, they have a shot. You know what I mean. If I was in that dressing room, um, I'd be just thinking, right, we've got to, we've got to throw everything at this. We've got to. This isn't a game where they they sit back. And two years ago, they sat back and they tried to slow the game down and they kicked the letter off the ball in the semi final in 2017. Munster's biggest strength that I've seen the last number of years, when they've played really well and dominated teams, is when they hold on to the ball and. They don't overcomplicate the game plan, um, but they can bring, you know, they can bring the number of phases into the twenties, and and that tires teams out and it has an effect. I know it's very attritional, and and but I think that's that's what they've got to do tomorrow. They need to work right through the roof from the players, and and hope that they can just be really strong defensively and and have a good set piece. So, um, and then if an opportunity too comes, that they take it, and you know, if they get. If they were to get into a situation where they nudge themselves in front um, and they stay within touching distance or even ahead of Saracens going into the second half, well, then that belief and that confidence will start to grow. And there's a lot of big characters in that monster side and there'll be a real hunger and a desire to try and to try and compete. So um, part of me says, look, and the reality is most people say, look, Saracens are just too strong. But I just have a sense and a feeling that because Munster are not expected to, to win this game, that they might they might give it a real good crack. They have to be brave, Quinny, don't they? Um, I mean, you mentioned the game in 2017. I was watching it back during the week. It was kind of easy to forget because of the full-time scoreline, but Munster were only 6-3 down at half-time. But they didn't really fire a shot at all, did they? And you, you think about Saracens, they were probably in the dressing room going, we have you right where we want you now, because they just upped it in the second half then and pulled away from them. Munster have to fire a shot this time, can you talk about Tyler Blaine all bit of a different type of out half to, to Joey Carberry but I think he's going to have to take the ball to the line I think someone like Chris Farrell is going to be absolutely vital we've seen he can run through players he can run over them but he's also got the passing game as we saw for the build up to Keith Earls try second try in Edinburgh so they're going to have to throw the ball around a little bit as well not get sucked into a mad Harry Carey game with Saris but they're going to have to be a little bit brave aren't they? Yeah, I think so. It's a very good point, Keane. They they have to they have to really go for this because there's no point in sitting in a dressing room afterwards thinking, look, we tried to contain them, keep the score down, and hope that um, you know that 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 we kept ourselves in it with ten minutes to go. And that's, that I don't think that's going to happen here. You've got to you've got to try and play against good teams, and how you do that is hold on to the ball yourself and be intelligent with what you're trying to do. I have no issue with them kicking because you know overplaying in their own half is going to force mistakes and put pressure on uh, on themselves. Um, just kicking intelligently and just forcing Saracens into mistakes and hope then that they can build a real tempo through their own team and, and, and match them physically. They try, you know, Saracens try to physically dominate teams. And so being brave isn't about throwing the ball all over the place. It's just having the ability and the confidence to maybe throw in an offload and just put pace and tempo into the game and, and try and instill a belief that if they if they get going, um, they're not going to get through this with a subpar performance. They need to, you know, really get it on the money here, everybody throughout the team. And and look, they have a chance. It's very difficult. And, and bravery is probably something that you'd never question of a, of a Munster team. But just intelligence uh, and bravery together will, will certainly help them. Yeah, Alan, you mentioned throwing the ball all around the place there a minute or so ago, and I think that brings us nicely to Toulouse against Leinster. Uh, Toulouse have just been an absolute joy to watch again. I, I don't know, is it just the, the age I am and the kind of era when I would have started really getting into rugby, but it just feels right to see a Toulouse team playing like this again. Yeah, it's, uh, 
I, I tell you, in round five, Neil, when they came to Dublin, um, there was a real sense of this Toulouse side can beat Leinster and mm. Leinster were missing a number of internationals and they were on the back of an incredible run uh, to Toulouse and uh, Leinster just out-muscled them on the day, frustrated the life out of them, held on to the ball so well, made very, very few mistakes and just wore them out. And at the end of that game, I think when Adam Byrne goes in for the bonus point try, I thought that's an incredible performance from Leinster. Um, they just never give Dupont, Intimac, Ramos, any of these guys a sniff of the ball and uh, they were brilliant on the day and they've got to do the same again on Sunday because I think this Toulouse side has got better since that that game. You could argue and say, well, look, it was a marker and this is Europe and it's different than the top 14 and this is where Leinster are at and this is where you can win all the games you like in the top 14, but this is the real deal and you had a sense of that after that game that Leinster or Toulouse have got to go away and, and Europe is just a different kettle of fish, but They've been brilliant and got better since. And I think one of the key things about this Toulouse side is they've got fitter together. Their skill set has improved. Um, they've been blowing teams away. They've only lost one game against away to Toulon in the top 14 since that game. And they're the type of side who can be porous in defence, but their attack game is just through the roof. Their confidence, their belief, their counter-attacking game. And they kind of send send out a message that, look, if you score, that's mine. We're just going to go up the field and score ourselves next. So Leinster have got to be very, very wary. And the issue for Leinster at the moment is they're undercooked together as a team. Um, the worry is that can they just turn up on, on Sunday? Um, Leo Cullen will pick a side of quality for sure, but they've got to get it right early on in the game and lay down a marker because uh, I think they nearly got caught against Ulster in, in that quarter final. Mm -hmm. They've got to be so much better against this, this Toulouse side because they will create opportunities and they will probably learn from that game in round five. Yeah, you mentioned the possibility of, you know, a, an undercooked Leinster. You know, they struggled maybe at times against Ulster a few weeks ago in the quarterfinal. I saw in the Irish Examiner this morning, Brendan O'Brien wrote that Leinster views 44 players over the last three games. And... Like on one hand, it's fantastic they their home semi final in the Pro 14 wrapped up by the first week of March. But is it act, does it actually become a little bit difficult to to manage the intensity and to manage the I suppose manage the ferocity of of of, of your performances when when everything is sewn up that early in a season and, and just trying to maintain things. Yeah, it's 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 been a strange few weeks for Leinster because um, usually um, it's very on on. It's it's not normal that a team has, has secured a home semi final so early in the with so many rounds to go in the Pro 14. Um, we'll know on on, Mon on Sunday evening whether that has helped them or not because they're a side that like to be put under pressure. They like to keep that intensity within the group and and you could argue that maybe that intensity hasn't been there in the last few weeks. That high standard that we we associate um, no matter who plays for Leinster that there's a real standard and they've spoken about that over the years, many of their players and, you know, the draw against Benetton is un -Leinster like the loss last week against Glasgow, un -Leinster like um, I know that there was no great significance, no significance to the league, but just psychologically, I think Leo Cullum would have preferred to have a, you know, Robbie Henshaw, Toner, Ringrose, Sexton, you know, all these guys uh, playing last week and playing for 50 or 60 minutes and get them a hit out, um, given what happened in the quarterfinal. But that, that hasn't happened, that he's been able to get everybody out in the field. There's a number of changes again. So it is a concern. Are they good enough to, to turn up at the Aviva and get it right on Sunday? For sure, they are. Mm -hmm. But they've got to start the game well. And if they give Toulouse any sort of confidence or self-belief, or let them get any sort of early scores in the game, it could be a difficult day for them. OK, Quinny, I know you have to go very quickly, though. Two words. Who's who's your final? No explanation, <laughs> just two two teams. Saracens, Leinster. <sighs> OK, Quinny, you traitor. Get off the line. No, I'm going to say... <laughs> <laughs> Quinny, cheers for joining us. All the best. Enjoy the matches of the weekend. Uh, look... As much as you might love to see Munster and Leinster, it, it, like it is just hard to argue with. Just the sheer facts of it all. Saracens are the team to beat in this campaign, Keen, at the moment. And like it is no, it's no disrespect to Munster to say that, you know, Saracens probably are on paper the 
a big favourites at the very least. No, they definitely are, and they're getting their players back at the right time. Like I mentioned earlier, you look at Owen Farrell coming back in the team. How many points was it? Fifty odd they scored against Glasgow in the quarter final without their chief playmaker, which is phenomenal. Makovunapola might be back. Brad Barrett is going to be back. Um, it, it looks like. He's a player who's massively important to what they do. So they're getting their big guys back. Munster are missing a couple of them. But like I was saying to Quinny there, the biggest thing for Munster is to fire a shot. They didn't do it last year in Bordeaux against Racing. They were nearly worse again at the Aviva against Saracens mm -hmm. because it was such a negative game plan. Like Quinny was saying, they kicked the letter off the ball. So if they, as long as they go out and fire a shot, I think they'll be they'll be happy with where they've got. Not that they'll be happy to lose in the semi final. Don't get me wrong, but as long as they show a better version of themselves. Mm -hmm. OK, we do have a few more rugby stories to get to this morning. First, though, here's Brian O'Driscoll on Leinster against Toulouse this Sunday. It would be difficult viewing for Leinster as well in that they got, they got outplayed for large parts of that game. So they'll feel that they've used up their get-out-of-jail card and that they won't get a second bite with, um, with the Toulouse team. I went over and saw their semi-final in the um, La Défense uh, arena and they were sublime. So Toulouse are well and truly back. The performance levels then against Ulster, do you put that down to just an off day or simply that Leinster can't get to the level they want if they don't have Toner, Sexton, Henshaw on the pitch? You, you know, the best teams, are, are Bar Barcelona ever as good without Messi? Mm. No, they're not. So Which one of them is Messi? <laughs> <laughs> But, it, but it, even the, you know, the amalgamation of the three of them mm. you know, combines something that the great players you know, in football or any sport bring. And um, the comfort that seeing a Dev Tone or seeing a Robbie Henshaw, seeing a John, Johnny Sexton in the team sheet uh, for all the other players, the comfort that brings, it, it's an intangible um, where all, immediately confidence is higher. I looked at that Leinster team in the quarterfinal and I saw a vulnerability for the first time and um, they're you know they're playing Sean O'Brien at seven you know but ordinarily if Josh van der Fleer and Dan Levy were fit would he be getting in the team possibly not mm. um, so it's mad that we're talking about you know a Sean O'Brien who two years ago was absolutely brilliant yeah. in the Lions he's got to take one of these because chances is, because is, because you know the opportunities have yeah. been taken away from others through injuries so um, yeah, I, I think Leinster will, will feel as though they've managed to navigate their way through. They, they know they don't have a second chance. Yeah, that's Brian O'Driscoll there talking about Leinster's chances against Toulouse on Sunday. Another part of that team news we were mentioning, we mentioned Keith Earls missing. For Leinster though, it looks like Jameson Gibson Park is going to be out. Mm. That, that makes Leo Collins' decision for him over, you know, is it James Lowe, Jameson Gibson Park or Scott Fardy? Yeah, because there was some suggestion earlier in the week that it might actually be Gibson Park and Fardy who get it, which it would have been incredible to think again that James Lowe would, would miss out. And the one thing about if that had happened is you're having your two overseas signings on the bench, you know, to leave out a, a game-breaker like James Lowe. And, geez, it must be tough. To, those conversations that Leo Collins must have with those guys must be extremely tough because they are all meritorious, worth, worth their place in the squad. Obviously, and players who probably would walk into most other starting yeah, 15s. Absolutely, and the thing about Gibson Park is though he becomes Irish qualified in June, yeah. so obviously for next season this won't be an issue. Yeah. Um, I think the Scott, Scott Fardy was probably always going to play anyway because he's just such an important player, but with uh, Mick Kearney and Ross Maloney ruled out that kind of made that part of the decision so in one way maybe Leo Cullen it makes it a little bit easier that his hand is forced but I think everyone wants to see James Lowe playing at the weekend don't they we haven't seen enough from this season we've, yeah. we've barely seen him since he got sent off actually in Thomas Park over Christmas so I'm sure he'll be itching to get out there and prove a point on the big stage as well um, Are Leinster as good as they were 12 months ago? No No I don't think they are I mean I think they were so good last season and you look at the calibre of players they lost, Easton Asewa, Joey Carvey, Jordy Murphy, who his, his worth has been proven I think since he's left because yeah. you see how well he's playing for Ulster and he's right back in the World Cup frame now with the, with the injuries. Um, I don't think they are as good but that's not to say they're not good if you know what yeah. I mean. They, they, were, they were at such a peak last yeah. season but for them to drop down they could still do the double again this year and I don't think anyone would be surprised but um, yeah, you kind of forget that uh, when Toulouse beat them over in Toulouse that Leinster threw two intercepts that resulted in tries. So I think they'll be mindful of that as well. They absolutely, Quinny was mentioned there, they smothered them at the RDS. And I thought Toulouse were, were really disappointing that day. But 
they are better than what they were in January as well. I think is it two defeats in 23 games and they had that mad game against Claremont at the weekend which it looked great and the razzle dazzle was kind of similar to the quarter final against Racing but will that be will that work against a Leinster side I, I don't know. Toulouse have plenty of firepower but I think they'll offer up chances. I think um, Reggie Sonis actually is worth a, worth a mention. Um, yeah, you're writing about him as well, aren't you? Yeah, he's a yeah. really interesting fella. He spent uh, three years in Bandon in West Cork and there's just been this horde of Munster players who've come through in the last couple of years. He likes a Finney in Witcherly, his younger brother Josh, who just won the under-20s Grand Slam. Very exciting prop coming through, the Coombs cousins, Gavin Liam. So West Cork rugby has really been on the rise, but um, basically Reggie Sonis, a former flanker for Toulouse, came over and he spent, he wanted to take a step back. He came from Bordeaux, step back from the sort of demanding professional environment. And he went in and he worked in Bandon RFC and he worked in Bandon Grammar, which I don't know if you've seen as well, the, the Munster schools, like yeah. they, they're on the up as well. So he's got the he's, final, was it last year or the year before? Year, yeah, I think it was year four. They, they've done, he, he did an incredible job, but he, he was so laissez-faire when he was walking around with his beret and his Crocs around Yeah, there was, like, there was a great photo as well of him walking into the RDS, walking into the yeah. RDS this year before the yeah. Leinster game yeah. and just beret, Crocs, yeah. holding his cup of coffee. You can imagine him walking around the streets abandoned <laughs> like that, but it, it's a great story because when he arrived, I was writing about it the paper we were chatting to Richie Grager in the week about him and the people of West Cork couldn't believe that they, they got a guy of this calibre like I mean he was in demand by the top European yeah. clubs which was proven when Toulouse paid a lot of money to get him to back get him back yeah, yeah so, I'm, so sorry the point about it is he has brought a bit of an edge to that Toulouse pack and that's what Richie Gray was saying that you know he, he's from Toulouse he played for Toulouse he, he gets what the culture is about and that's been a big part of it. you look at Hugo Mola um, Clement Poitrino and William Servat, obviously all former top players at Toulouse, and they're all on the coaching staff now, and that's been a big part of the renaissance of Toulouse, and Reggie Sonis has brought that real hard edge to the pack. I think they're 100% in their set piece, their scrum. 100% in scrums, I yeah. think they are, did I take it down here, they are in, I think they're, they're second for line out. Saracens are first. Like, that's, Pretty, pretty good going and especially yeah. especially for a French team and what he was saying was that he drills them a lot and it's a lot of repetition whereas yeah. the, the stuff you hear about French rugby is it's, it's not like that it's way more relaxed so um, that makes them an even more dangerous proposition but I guess the people in West Cork can sort of half claim half claim uh, Reggie's on <laughs> um, One thing we actually haven't really spoken about at all and it's a story that would have come out probably just after the lads would have been finished yesterday on OTBAM but uh, Rory Best confirmed mm. he, he is going to retire fully after the World Cup in Japan. Um, it was something you were talking about when you came into the office this morning, how, you know, it was it was unofficially it was unofficially confirmed probably for the last few months, but it wasn't until yesterday when we had the official line that it was gonna happen in the press conference and and you know, you were saying you were actually given that it was it was a, a poorly kept secret probably over the last few months. You were probably you thought it was uh, surprising just how emotional Rory got yesterday. Yeah, it was funny. I actually did an interview with him over the phone last Friday that hasn't been published yet. And I didn't really go too much into it because he's been asked so much about it. Mm. But um, he dropped loads of hints that, that it was coming. And it was very it was fairly obvious. But he, I wouldn't say he was emotionless, but there wasn't much emotion in what he was saying. He was very comfortable. Um, again, it was over the phone. But... Yeah, yesterday when he sat down and the cameras were on, I was I was really taken aback by really how hard it hit him. Even for the first question, uh, he was barely able to you know speak, which I thought it was great to see. It showed how much it meant to him. And this is a guy who's obviously the captain of Ireland, and then he does a lot of press conferences for the captain's run. And he's just such a steady hand. He he never really you know shirks anything. He's always positive in what he says. But yeah, it was it was it took me by surprise. It was it was good to see. He brought up his brother as well, and the conversations that he had had with him and I think that reminded him of you know how special it was to get a chance to, to play with him but look he's had an incredible career hasn't he he was sort of saying to me that um, the last couple of years he has really felt it um, in his body you know and that in a few years time he wants that Tim Lyon out there you can see it on the screen yeah, alongside his brother picture, Simon yeah. uh, Simon would have been forced to retire in 2008 it was actually in a regular heartbeat in the end that for Simon Best to retire. Yeah, I was just saying he's one of those players who kind of you haven't really seen or heard much from him. Yeah. But um, yeah, Best was saying that he's been feeling it. You know, he said he ha doesn't like to show it, but he has been feeling it in his body. And you look at it, he's got uh, I think three young kids. 
and you look at the way he plays the game, he hasn't changed really his style of play. He still goes in for the jackals and you see how, you know, it's such a controversial topic at the moment. But he's conscious, I think, of, you know, in the next few years, he wants to be able to play with his young kids and this is important. So, yeah, the World Cup is just a fitting ending, isn't it? You know, the Ireland captain hopefully going out on a high. Um, is, he, is, he, uh, is he a lock for a starting place in Japan? I still think so. I still think so. I, it, it's definitely it's definitely debatable. I think if Niall Scannell was to have an outstanding game tomorrow and Munster were to win and go on to win the Champions Cup, I think the debate might be get a bit get a bit uh, more heated. But yeah, I think so. For me, he is. Um, He's not the same player he was, but he's such a massive leader. Obviously, his line-out throwing can be an issue, but to, to make such a big change at this stage, so close to the World Cup, I think would, wouldn't really be in Schmidt's sort of you know, makeup. But then again, maybe he might surprise us all. But yeah, I think best m- main focus now is to make sure he gets back for Ulster's running, which he is hoping to do, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, also as well, Ron Nogara writing this morning in the Irish Examiner. Uh, one little small snippet actually to take out of it. Uh, he's writing about how he's, he's away in Fiji, having a little break at the moment. The Crusaders are on a, a bye week in, the, uh, in Super Rugby at the moment. But he's saying... Uh, that pretty much this rumoured move for him to France in the World Cup probably doesn't look like it's going to happen now. One of the things I promised with this column is keeping it factual. So while there's been a lot of speculation in recent weeks about me going to the World Cup as part of a French backroom team, I did say all along there was nothing concrete to report, and so it has proved. I have, con- I have, I had conversations with senior people in the FFR, and I was interested in a detailed proposition. But the conversation never got to that point, to the bit where a specific role, working with specific people, was on the table. I've heard no more in recent weeks, so I can assume it's off the table now. Um, no surprise really that the move fell apart because uh, the French Rugby Federation couldn't provide enough details really or enough of a plan. Yeah, and in fairness, you you got to love Ron O'Gar and how he, how he handles himself in the media. I know he was on here with the lads and off the ball and he's always so honest. I mean, he, he, this is what he has said from day dot about this whole saga and the French press had it that he was close to signing. Um, I yeah. just love how this wasn't like a big story. It's just kind of like thrown in yeah. midway through a column. It's kind of classic, his, <laughs> his style, isn't it? I saw him, he was doing, with the lads the other day, chatting from Fiji, like, you know, yeah. just off the beach. But uh, I think he's played this very, very well. If he had gone in there, it was kind of a shot to nothing. If yeah. it had gone well, it had gone well, but it wouldn't have damaged his reputation. But he's still sitting pretty in one of the most sought, sought after jobs at Crusaders. And, you know, the talk over there in New Zealand is that Scott Robertson could be the another other Irish man, actually, who obviously spent time in Ulster, but he could be the next All Blacks coach. And if he gets the next All Blacks coach, and they seem to have a really good relationship, O'Gara and Robertson, you never know that O'Gara could end up there. Which So his career trajectory as a player was just always on the way up, and as a coach, it's been no different. It's brilliant to watch. Um, he's obviously done all his work outside of Ireland, racing uh, onto Crusaders, and who knows from here. Himself and Paul O'Connell are always being mm. talked about. Any time there's a sniff of any kind of a coaching vacancy in Ireland. Their names are being thrown in. Let's get them back. Let's bring them back over here. Is it, is it not better in the long run, probably for Irish rugby and for the two of them, to stay out of the bubble for as long as possible? Because in the grand scheme of things, in terms of coaches, they're still young men. They still have a, you know, there's potentially 20, 30 years of coaching still to go. To stay outside of the, the Irish rugby bubble and to learn as much as you can about various different countries, but rugby mm. cultures and bring it all back then at a later date. It, like, I just kind of wonder a little bit what's the rush in bringing them back? As good as they might be when they come back, you know. I suppose you're let, seeing. Let them learn more. Yeah, I suppose you're seeing two different sides of that because o- yeah. O'Gara certainly is doing that over the last few years. But you look at Paul O'Connell now, he's leaving Stad at the end of the season a year early and. That, that's a move that didn't work out at all. Apparently, like, you know, Heineken Mayer, the former Springbok coach, calls all the shots there. It's been very difficult, by all accounts, you know, to get his stamp on the team. Um, Heineken Mayer picks the team, doesn't always do the training with the forwards. So I think it's been very frustrating. Yeah, I think there is a point in that, but O'Connell still hasn't committed himself to, you know, that he's going to be involved with coaching. On O'Gara, I'd love to be a fly on the wall in the IRFU offices that when they're possibly in line for a new attack coach, although... There's some suggestion that uh, Andy Farrell might actually take on more of a role as a tackle, which would be very interesting. Mm. But when the IRFU were looking at one of their former players who will, let's face it, end up back here eventually, I wonder, are they going, OK, when is the time to, to pull the trigger and, and just get him back? Because 
when you see like the, the Crusaders, the type of rugby they play, and he has a massive hand in what they're doing. Some of the rugby that they play the best rugby in in Super Rugby. So, yeah, he's going to come back eventually. It's just a matter of time and when the RFU, I think, pull the trigger. It'd be interesting to see over the next few months because obviously his contract's up at the end of the Super Rugby season, mm. so he's going to be available technically unless he signs on again. Um, we're almost finished on rugby. One little quick thing we're going to bring up. Uh, both of us spotted us this morning. Uh, this is in the Independent. It's a syndicated column from Austin Healy uh, ahead of this weekend. Steady Blaindell may just be a better fit for Carberry for or than Carberry for Saracens tie. Before we go into it, let's hear what Austin Healy had to say on BT Sport back in January 2019. Probably better than Sexton, and if he could start for Ireland against England in that first opening Six Nations game, that'd be perfect. So that was Joey Carberry, probably better than Sexton. <laughs> now though, he's out. Tyler Blandell, do you know what, he's a better fit. Yeah, it's a classic classic flip-flop there, isn't it? Um, yeah, like, I think I can kind of see, what we, the point he was making was that Blandell is a bit more of a controlling yeah. 2010, which is fair enough. But I still think you need the bit of, you know, the game-breaking ability against the Saracens. teams. It goes back to what we talked about, about firing a shot. Now, Blindall is more than capable of doing it, but Joey Carberry has much more pace. He'll take the ball to the line much more aggressively. So I think that was his point. But yeah, it's uh, an interesting flip-flop after basically saying that... <laughs> uh, look, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll be fair to Healy. Like, he does, he does qualify. He says Blindall may actually suit Munster better for a game like this. He understands the game plan, kicks well and can move sides around. That becomes more of a threat against a team like Saracens, who are so dread well drilled defensively that it's going to be a tactical manoeuvre that beats them rather than a piece of individual magic and a lot of fighting spirit and in fairness to him look he does absolutely sing the praises of Joey Carberry throughout that uh, time to move on at the moment it's uh, time for last chance actually for our competition our brilliant competition with thanks to Turkish, Air Turkish Airlines proud sponsors of Cricket Ireland here on OTBAM we're giving you the chance to fly anywhere that Turkish Airlines go to to enter all you have to do is head over to offtheball.com and fill in in the entry form at the moment. Winner will be announced just before 9 o'clock this morning, so around the end of the show, it really is your very, very, very last chance to enter. It's all to celebrate a massive summer of cricket for Ireland. Ireland is facing the busiest summer of cricket we've ever known, hosting some of the biggest teams in the world, England, the West Indies, Bangladesh, Cricket Ireland are also hosting Zimbabwe and Afghanistan later in the summer and on the 3rd of May the Irish team will face England in Malahide with a tri-series against Bangladesh and the West Indies to follow. Turkish Airlines are the proud sponsors of the Ireland men's cricket team to celebrate the renewal of this partnership for a further two years. They're giving away a fantastic prize of a pair of flights, a pair of flight tickets to anywhere in their network. So get on to offtheball.com to enter that as soon as possible. We are going to turn to football next. Daniel Harris will be joining us to look ahead at a massive weekend of Premier League action. First, though, we can hear from uh, Kenny Cunningham, who was talking about Man City and Liverpool and the title race. The sounds of it, then, they may actually have to be quite busy in the transfer market because you look at last night and you do wonder as well whether that would have happened if Fernandinho was playing in the protection. He might have been able to give the back four. And Fernandinho is 33 at this stage. It doesn't seem as though they have a like-for-like -like replacement. Is that an area as well, that centre midfield where Gundion played last night, very different type of footballer to Fernandinho, where they need some sort of backup? Yeah, I think so. I think this will really hurt uh, Guardiola, no matter what he comes out publicly and says. That result last night could almost be a little bit of a, uh, of a watershed in terms of... I've spoken about kind of the, the centre-halves, uh, even uh, Mendy at left-back, Fernandinho, you're absolutely correct. A couple of players who can play in there. You could argue even Kevin De Bruyne playing at a hold in midfield position is good enough to do it in possession of football, getting the ball and getting a Manchester City uh, up the pitch. But of course, the defensive side of his game wouldn't be the mm. strongest. Good again as well. It was probably a little bit more efficient defensively than De Bruyne, but certainly hasn't got the presence of Fernandinho on that hold in midfield position. So you're absolutely right. He, he could go and spend big in terms of centre half hold in midfield. Uh, and even that uh, uh, left back position uh, in the summer, that that would be big money. But I think it's something which he has has to do because, generally speaking, football at the very highest level, any of those kind of small frailties, even in a team as as good as Manchester City, you, you do get found out. And it's in those areas of the pitch that we're speaking about that ultimately have cost uh, uh, Manchester City on occasion on the, on the very big stage. You look at Liverpool, for example. And I look at the, the setup of their team, the defensive setup of their team. I don't see those uh, weaknesses. And it's why I've always felt Liverpool have the edge over Manchester City in the league for quite some uh, time now. Just that kind of defensive uh, resilience across the defensive line, the protection they get in those central midfield areas. For me, Liverpool are a team who can sit in, 
uh, and soak up, uh, uh, soak up pressure and probably defend better in, in 1v1 situations as well than that kind of Manchester uh, City uh, defensive lineup. So, yeah, it'll be intriguing to see how Guardiola, uh, Guardiola sees that and also between now and the end of the season, how that championship uh, runoff uh, plays out between Manchester City and Liverpool and see who's, who falters and which, whichever team does, what are the reasons uh, why they do falter because Manchester City lose out again I think it'll be for the same reasons that we're talking about uh, why they've missed out in the semi-final for the Champions League as well. OK, Daniel Harris is joining us on the line now. Good morning, Daniel. Good morning. How are you doing? Um, Thank you. I will, we'll get to Manchester City and Liverpool a little bit later on because it's another massive weekend in the title race. I think every weekend for the last few weeks has been and will be for the next uh, month or so as well. But there was a story that we just touched on when we were going through our paper round this morning uh, on the back of the sun. It's uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has uh, apparently launched into a few of his uh, big names after the 3-0 defeat at the New Camp the other night. I don't know, would you have seen any of us uh, in the papers this morning? But it probably would have been warranted, I think, maybe with some of the performance. I think he questioned the the attitude of a few of them, that they weren't giving 100%. Is, is Ole Gunnar Solskjaer starting to really just discover what it's like now being the permanent manager as opposed to being the stand-in, as opposed to being the, the nice guy who's here just for a few months? Um, I'm, I'm not sure about that. I think when you hear him talk about United it seems quite clear that he spent quite a lot of time before he got the United job watching United play. So he probably had a fairly good idea of what he was coming to discover. And it went unexpectedly well at the beginning, but I don't think anyone's surprised. I'm, I'm certainly not surprised that he's had to have these kind of conversations because I think that you've got players who do that a certain level of mental fortitude and they're not reliable. You can't rely on their effort and you can't rely on their quality. So the fact that managers having to have those conversations is not surprising. I think the only surprising thing is that it's taken so long for them to be necessary. Yeah, five defeats and seven now at the moment. Like, are you worried at all about Ole Gunnar Solskjaer? Uh, no, not really. I'm not, I'm not suggesting he's going to be like, you know, sacked in two weeks' time or anything like that after lose a couple of games, but uh, you're, you're not really that overly worried with the signs you're seeing on the pitch. You, you know, you're expecting maybe uh, a lot really. of changes I in the summer. That, I would say that the chances are he's not the right man for the job because there are very few people existing <laughs> in the world who could do this job and succeed at it, I think. And things that are too good to be true generally are too good to be true. seems unlikely you can be a high-level player for United then turn up having managed Mould and Cardiff and be a great manager. But I think that um, what's happening at the moment is inevitable because if United carried on as they were doing for the first few months when Solskjaer was the manager, you'd be getting championship form out of them. And this is not a championship team. So I think it was inevitable that there was going to be a drop. And if you look at the games they've lost, I'd be more inclined to say, well, which games do I think that they've been beaten in when I think those were the fault of the manager rather than the fault of the players not being good enough? I'm not sure that like, this team, however any manager arranges it, is going to be able to go to the new Camp and get a result. Um, I felt like the cup game against Wolves, Solskjaer picked the wrong team, rushing back too many players from injury, and when it wasn't going United's way, he didn't change it in time. Against Arsenal, Lukaku missed an empty net almost from four yards out. I don't think that's on Solskjaer. The finishing against Wolves in the league also, United should have had that game gone, finished well before they lost the game. And again, it looked like Solskjaer picked the right team that night, picked the right tactics, and the players weren't. The players didn't execute them properly. They played quite well, but in the end, they weren't ruthless. And I don't think that that is on Solskjaer either. So it's easy to say, well, this is Solskjaer's fault, he's not got enough experience. But if the same people who are saying that are also agreeing that the players aren't good enough, then what do they expect? Um, so I think that the scale of the job is becoming more apparent. But at the same time, there are some good players there and players who, playing in a good team, would probably be quite good. What he needs is he needs to find players this summer to elevate that, players who can actually make a not-such-a-good team a good team and he doesn't have a lot of margin for error because he won't get given enough money to be able to waste any of it. Yeah, you mentioned finding players has to be important. Is it even more important to find those players to play a little bit closer to your own goal than the opposition's? Um, I'm actually not sure about that, in that obviously United could do with some better centre-backs. Of course they could. But if you had a better midfield, you'd find the centre-backs had quite a lot less work to do. And if you look, for example, at Manchester City, um, if, you gave, um, if you gave their centre-backs the amount of work that Smalling and Lindelof have to do, 
I think you'd see that they conceded quite a lot more goals. And similarly, if you put City's midfield in front of Smalling and Lindelof, you would find that they look more solid because they would have less to do. So I think that what United really need is they need two midfield players to, who are going to enable them to control the game. Because at the moment, United are unable to control games against midfield, even against kind of good Premier League teams like Leicester. Never mind the better Premier League teams and then never mind the better teams in Europe. So I would say that if you sort the midfield out, then you would immediately create more chances, keep the ball more and protect the defence better. And those would be the key elements of the team that I would say you have to improve whatever happens. If they end up signing a better centre-back, then that would be good. But it definitely isn't where I would start. Yeah, um, looking ahead, we'll move on, I suppose, like, you know, towards the title race. Liverpool and Man City both in action this weekend. Liverpool, they're away to Cardiff on Sunday. Before that, Man City will have the chance to get back above Liverpool uh, and you know move level on 34 games played as well when they take on Spurs tomorrow. Just a few days after that incredible game at the idea the other night, uh, I can't for the life of me see how we're going to get anything even close to that tomorrow morning. No, I would, I would expect not. I mean, I think my, I would expect that City will win that game quite comfortably because, I mean, both teams need the points, but and both teams will be on the come down. But City will probably be fired with some level of injustice, and they're just a better team. Uh, so I would expect them to get it done. But um, I was surprised because I think I was, I was surprised that Spurs got past City. But also, I was surprised that Spurs got past City by playing how they played. And this isn't particularly a criticism of Spurs because. Half the team that played weren't fit, and they're without Harry Kane as well, and they've still found a way to get it done. But it didn't seem like they got past City by outplaying them or by out-tacticking them. It's just because football is a chaotic game, and City made mistakes at the wrong moment, and sometimes those things happen. If City play anything like the way they played on, on Wednesday night, they'll win quite comfortably. But then, if they'd have played anything like that in the first leg, they would have won the tie quite comfortably. So... You can never exactly predict what's going to happen, but I think that City will be okay in that one. So if, if City and Liverpool both win all of their games, which are now in the end of the season, it's City who win the title. Uh, even still, Would you still make City the favourites overall? Like They do have the tougher run in Spurs tomorrow and Man United coming on Wednesday. Um, I, get, I, th I think it's marginal now. I mean, yeah. I've been sitting here all season saying City will win the league and probably by a few points because they're much better than Liverpool. And... I mean, I guess I still think that City's best is way better than Liverpool's best, but Liverpool have done a phenomenal job. And I think in the end, you've got to look at it and admire what Jurgen Klopp's done. Because when you look at Liverpool's players, and if you just look at their 1-11, to you kind of wonder how, how it works in that Van Dijk is obviously an elite level player and the, three, and the three forwards are really good. Although if you had free reign to go and buy any of the forwards in the world, you wouldn't be taking any of theirs. And... What that tells you is Jurgen Klopp has has worked out a blend. He's worked out a team that works from front to back, and he's also worked out a team that works in partnerships. So the front three work. You get enough goals out of them, and you generally get enough goals at the right time. And he's got a midfield that protects the defence and gets enough of the ball to those players, despite the fact that when you actually look at that midfield, in whatever configuration of Cater, Wijnaldum, Milner, Henderson it is, somehow it's working and that is that's that is um, all on Jurgen Klopp really and you can you can only admire what he's done so to start saying Liverpool are going to lose games to crap teams at this point I mean I've been waiting for that to happen most of the season and it hasn't happened so they don't look nervous now sort of at the end of January at the beginning of February when they drop points to West Ham and they drop points to Leicester those weren't good performances that the chaotic nature of football somehow turned into draws those were performances of a team that is going for a title and is nervous and you can feel the crowd getting nervous. But I think mainly thanks to Sadio Mane on the pitch, who was the one who stood up at that point, they've managed to turn it around. And now Liverpool, even when they've been chasing games, when they chased the game against Tottenham, they weren't doing so in a frantic way. They were doing so in an intense way, but in a controlled way, like a team that knew they were going to score. And also against Chelsea, when they were nil nil at half time, that is an opportunity to get nervous, and they didn't take it. They were they were cold and they were furious, and they managed to get it done. So I would expect Liverpool to win their games, um, but then I would expect City to win their games as well because they're significantly better than all the teams they're playing. I guess history tells us that someone will drop points somewhere because it's unusual for one team even to go on a winning run to end the season, never mind two. But if I was betting, I would marginally be betting on City, but generally I'd be staying out of that.
Yeah, the, you mentioned the mentality there at Liverpool, which I, I kind of found really, really interesting because I'd say it was probably a couple of months ago, I can't remember exactly, they played Crystal Palace and we would have done live commentary of that game that day. And I remember all of us remarking just like, even the, our commentary team were saying it's just the atmosphere around Anfield. Every single person was so on edge. It was so tense. The players on the pitch looked nervous. The fans looked nervous. And we were thinking, how in the name of God are we going to do this for another two, two and a half months? But it just kind of seems that the longer it's going on, they're actually become, they're just getting used to it. The, the fans don't seem to be as on edge or as nervous. The players seem to be a lot more a lot more comfortable and controlled, even when they are chasing a game when they might be level or you know when they were behind against Southampton a few weeks ago. It seems that they're kind of growing into the title race a little bit more from a mental side of things. Yeah, I would agree with that. They, they've got used to the pressure. And I guess, it, in a way, as a player, these are, this is why you play. These are the days of your lives. If you can't enjoy the level of tension, then you're in the wrong sport, really. And in, in, in the wrong profession and they've started to look like they're enjoying it and they started to look like they believe that it's going to happen for them and it doesn't matter if destiny is a load of nonsense if people buy into it because once people start believing in those things it gives them the freedom to go and, to go and perform and that's what we've seen from Liverpool and what we look about Liverpool is there's no area of their team at the moment that you could say isn't functioning. They've had the problem of creativity from midfield all season. And, I mean, you can see why Klopp wanted to sign Fekir in the summer. But actually, at the moment, they appear to have found some level of solution to that that might not be a long-term solution of playing Jordan Henderson further forward. But for now, it's working. And it doesn't need to work for that much longer. And when you look at their fixtures, Newcastle the way, Newcastle will make it difficult and it might be tight for a bit. But... In the end, the class will probably tell. So if City do drop points, what it will probably come down to is whether they bottle that last game against Wolves because the weight of the pressure of 29 years is upon them. But otherwise, um, it's hard to see them dropping points. But you never quite know what will happen with injuries or what will happen. They've got to play Barcelona twice. So there is still quite a lot of football to happen. And you should never assume that because the team's playing well at one moment, it will be playing well at the next moment, never mind a few moments down the road, because football teams have 11 players in them. That's a lot of moving parts. So momentum is hard to gain and easy to lose. But at the moment, they're looking very strong. And as I said, like Jurgen Klopp's done a phenomenal job in making that happen because his, his, they've stayed with City all the way. And um, that's not easy to do. City are also a team that is very grooved and honed. Um, and so in order to stay with them, you have to get a lot of points. And that's like that's really why I thought Liverpool would fall down. If it was a low points tally, then it's easier for an inferior team to win the league. And I don't think that Liverpool are as good as City, but they've managed to find a way to keep beating everyone else. And uh, yeah, you can only you can only congratulate them for that. Um, to go back to Spurs and Man City the other night as well. Um, I would have seen you talk about VAR a lot over the last year or so on Twitter and how you would have said it kind of takes the, the joy out of the moment of being a football fan, you know, when that ball hits the net and all of a sudden now you're kind of wondering, is this, you know, is it a goal, is it not a goal, is it a penalty, is it this or that, is it a red card? Um, has, has the last few couple of months maybe a Champions League, has that just reinforced your opinion of it or has the incredible number of VAR moments we've had, has, has it changed at all? Uh, no, not really. I guess for me, like when your team scores, that is not just the greatest moment in football. That's the greatest moment you get to experience in your life on a regular basis. Um, no offence to my wife and daughter, but <laughs> I understand, I understand the difference. But, um, so, so, so what? Like just a, a goal against a goal against Fulham in a three o'clock game to go two 0 up. That is that is better than than being a married man and having a kid. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, uh, that, 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 that crucial goal obviously is the greatest feeling that exists. Like you never experience spontaneous ecstasy like that really in any other in any other environment, in any other circumstance in your life. And I personally wouldn't sacrifice that for anything. And for people watching at home. Obviously, it does increase the drama. But I think it's funny because the VAR decision um, at the end, the Sterling goal that was ruled out for offside, that to me is in some ways shows you the, what, what, the, the, the best side of VAR. And the, other, and the other side shows you the worst of VAR because it's the best of VAR in that 
the decision was a howler. And that's sort of that's the kind of the catchphrase that people always talk about in cricket, where they say that the point of DRS is to eliminate the howler. And I felt like that's what VAR did there. But on the other hand, it felt like that was that Sterling one. It, they, they, when Aguero was offside, it didn't need backwards and forwards. It didn't need lines on the screen. Yeah. It was yeah. it was a really clear offside. So it was quite a significant error, I thought, by the officials. And actually, one where you think, lads, you should actually be spotting that first time. Obviously, you want you want you want the referees to get the decisions correct. But no one fell in love with football because the standard of decision making was correct. <laughs> sometimes decisions are correct, and sometimes decisions are incorrect. And if you're an adult you should be able to put that behind you quite quickly because it's not real life, it's football. So for me, it doesn't really alter. I don't feel better about football when the referees make correct decisions. So, I mean, VAR personally has actually enriched my life quite significantly this year because my team beat PSG thanks to VAR and I now don't need to worry because for the, for the rest of this season because the treble that my team won is safe for another year. But I wouldn't have had any complaints if City had gone through with an offside goal because sometimes it happens and you move on and you forget about it. So I haven't really changed my opinion about VAR because I just find the whole thing quite strange and spooky and artificial. And it's and I'm just I'm not invested in officials getting correct decisions. I'm invested in the emotion and flow of the game much more. But I understand why people like VAR. So, yeah, I wouldn't call someone anything for liking VAR. But for me, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't turn me on. Hey, hey Daniel, how are things? Um, do you think we'll ever get to a point with VAR where maybe you can hear what the, you know, the, the VAR officials essentially are saying? Because I think as a viewer, it's such a strange experience when you're watching it on TV and, you know, it, it pops up on the screen at the stadium before you know at home, you know, what, what's actually going on. Do you think we'll ever get to a position where we can get an insight into what the officials are saying to each other? It's weird, isn't it? Because at the moment, I think the first thing they have to do in that regard is allow spectators to see the mm. action. But they're still kind of sort of stuck in the 70s and 80s that somehow if a decision is contentious or right or wrong, then there'll be a riot. Yeah. And it's just, it's just a load of nonsense. But I think that that would prevent it from us from being able to hear. I mean, we might we might get there in the end. But I think the first step is to put that stuff on the screen. And once they do that, then it's probably eventually we'll be able to hear what the officials are saying. Although football crowds are quite noisy. Um, <laughs> it would be quite hard to be able to do that in the cacophony. Um, and I think officials presumably would like that not to happen because they're risk averse conservative types who would be worried that somehow they would say the wrong thing I don't, or there would be something that wouldn't, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't quite work. But yeah, I mean, I would be, I think that once it's already happening and it is already happening and we're not going back the other way, then you need to make it as comprehensive as possible and as spectator friendly as possible. And that is definitely part of it. So I would agree that is something that would be sensible. But I think that until, until we're allowed to see what's actually going on, it won't happen. Okay, Daniel, uh, thanks for joining us this morning, and we'll speak to you again soon. See you, lads. Bye. Take care. Uh, just a reminder as well, a lot of live Premier League coming up across our off-the-ball channels this weekend. Tomorrow on Today FM on Premier League Live at Sky Sports, uh, there's a double show on. The first part of that is going to be online. So if you go to todayfm.com forward slash PLL at 12.15 tomorrow, you can hear live and exclusive commentary of Manchester City against Spurs from the Etihad Stadium. And when the show starts at 2 o'clock then on the FM, uh, we'll bring you all the, the rest of the action uh, from the Etihad, as well as West Ham against Leicester at 3 o'clock. And then on Sunday on News Talk on Off the Ball from 1 p.m. in the afternoon, uh, I'll be with you that afternoon and we will have commentary of Everton against Manchester United. That's at half past one. Stephen Doyle and Alan Stubbs will be on commentary there. And then it's over to Liverpool uh, to see if maybe they might be going back above Man City at the top. Maybe they'll be extending their lead at the top. They are away to Cardiff. Ian Beach and Alan McLaughlin will be on commentary there. Uh, Kean, final thoughts before we leave you go. Um, what's What way do you lean when it comes to football? Oh, big fan. Yeah, absolutely big fan. Um, the VAR thing was interesting the other night because obviously I was kind of touching on what happens in rugby w with the TMO because I think that adds to the tension and you know at the Six Nations games you get the ref mics and then at the other games you don't and you, you realise how important it is and I know 
what Daniel was saying, okay, it's, it's different crowds and things like that, but it's very unfair, I think, to especially to the people who are at the games who are paying. Like, because for the most part, they don't even know, it's not even that, like, they don't even know what is being checked. They don't know, is it an offside? Is it a handball? Is it a penalty? Is it a potential red card? All they know is the game is stopped and the referee is checking something. Yeah, and then you're forced to get out your phone, aren't you, at yeah. a live event and get on Twitter and whatever, which should not be the case if mm. you're the one at the game experiencing it. But I don't know, I kind of... Uh, sometimes I'm all fervour and sometimes I, I agree with Daniel that that sort of euphoric moment, you know, you're missing that. But when you're getting the decisions correct, I think, you know, especially in such big games, it takes away that whole debate about, oh, was it on or off side, should have been allowed. But, um, yeah, no, I think the, it, it, the going down the route, some, something like rugby with the TMO, if VAR is here to stay, which it obviously looks like it is, then they're going to have to do something like that because it does add to the tension as well. You know, you've been at plenty of rugby games as well when they're checking a try in the corner or something. It adds to the tension and at the moment... In football, I feel like that's kind of lost because you don't know what's going on and it's actually the people at home who are more engaged, which shouldn't be the case yeah. uh, for, for, for a live event. Um, and when it comes to a team, what way do you lean? Uh, I have to say my allegiance. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, well, no, I'll, I'll, leave it, I'll put it to you this way. Who's going to win the title? Uh, well, I can't say Man United, so that might give you a clue. Um, <laughs> I think, I, I still think City, I think the thing about Liverpool is the, the conditioning of their players is phenomenal, considering the amount of rotation Pep does with City, and I know he's coming for criticism for De Bruyne not starting in the first leg, but these Liverpool players have played so many games this season, and they don't look like slowing down. Um, I think City, though, having been knocked out of Europe, that they're going to be like fuming. So I'd imagine that they might sneak it, but it's going to be cracker. Hopefully it does come down to the final day. Yeah, it's going to be brilliant. Uh, I had someone during the week on Twitter uh, thinking I was a Liverpool fan. I had to correct him very quickly. I'm not going to say who I sport, but it's, uh, I'm, so you not, made, I'm, not, I'm not a Liverpool you fan. Made me do, you made me out myself as a United fan, but you're not going to... I did. You outed yourself. I, I left that window open. You could have. You could have just not said anything. Just said but, nothing, yeah. um, before we go to uh, quick word on predictions, we've had a poll running actually this morning on our off the ball rugby at uh, on Twitter. Um, so Leinster, Leinster versus Saracens, Toulouse versus Saracens, Leinster Munster or Toulouse versus Munster. What was the say? What is the final lineup going to be? Forty seven percent of you said it is going to be Leinster against Saracens. 14% went for Toulouse against Saracens. Leinster and Munster uh, got 26% of the vote, including... Is that Tommy? Is that you voting there? I see the little tick beside it. Tommy thinks it's going to be Leinster against <laughs> Munster. And then 13%, the smallest vote, is going to be two upsets this weekend. Toulouse against Munster. Uh, what way are you calling it? Yeah, I think it's probably hard to disagree with that. I, the one thing I would say is as the week was going on, I was getting more hopeful and optimistic, but then having heard yesterday that Earls looked like he's going to miss out. Like I said, Jean Klein isn't 100% fit, whether he starts or not, he's not 100% fit. And then Joey Carberry, they're massive players. Mm -hmm. three, three massive players from Munster. And then Sarri's getting their big guns back. So I think... Earl's missing is, is a game changer and you don't often say that actually about a winger do you to, to be fair but that's how important he is to Munster again we saw it in the Edinburgh game so yeah I think Sarri's will probably nick it but hopefully Munster like I said fire a shot and, and you know do what they're capable of um, I, yeah I can't see Leinster I can't see Leinster losing it's such a big game it's a big stage They've so many big players who are looking to play themselves back into form. We didn't even mention Sean O'Brien, but this feels like a massive game for him. You heard Lancaster came out this week and mm. you know was calling for a big performance, and he was up doing media last week before the Glasgow game, and he was kind of saying, you know, there's more to come for me. We didn't really see that against Glasgow, and I was asking him has he tailored his game, but he, you know, in terms of carrying, but he said that's the one part of his game that you know is the missing piece at the moment because we haven't seen him, have we, as a destructive force? He seems to be hitting a lot more rocks, but um. The stage is set for these guys, Sexton, coming back in to, to prove a point. And, you know, at the Aviva, they're so hard to beat there. So, yeah, I'd imagine it would probably be Leinster, Saris, but keeping both fingers crossed for an All-Irish final. You're on duty at the Aviva. On, you're not in commentary, are you? No, I'm not. <laughs> Looking forward to it, actually. Yeah, well, the two games are going to be crackers, aren't yeah. they? It's a great weekend. And like I said, after all the stuff about Falau and Billy, Billy Vunapol, it's great to actually just have two cracking rugby games to look forward to. OK, Keen, thanks for coming into us and enjoy the Aviva on Sunday. OK, we have a brilliant feature for you now on OTBM. It's Andy Lee in conversation with former Olympian Kahlo O'Grady about his career and his life after boxing. Take it away, Andy. I'm here at whitecollarboxing.ie. I'm joined by Kahlo O'Grady. Uh, European champion, Olympian, professional boxer, 
and White Collar Boxing Supremo. Carl, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, there's a few other titles in there as well, Andy, <laughs> but I, I'll, get, I'll get to them later yeah. on as well, so I will. Uh, the, the, is it the cow, the cow KO, or is that what yeah, they call it? Yeah, <laughs> I heard a story I'll about, tell you about I'll tell you about the cow, now that's a, that's a dark uh, piece of my life, so it is, you know. Carl, how'd you get into boxing? Um, I suppose uh, we grew up on a farm in County Kildare, a dairy farmers. So um, it wouldn't, it'd be normally Gaelic football, hurling may, um, that you you would have chosen. We did, we we did um, all those. There was myself and my brother. But um, at the time, Barry McGuigan was, you know, was winning world titles, and that was back in 1985. A local boxing club opened up just a couple of miles down the road, and. Um, we we joined up and we never looked back. Just yeah. got hooked on it, really. And did you take to it naturally? Was it something that you enjoyed straight away? Um, yeah, I remember the first night. The first night you went down there was sparring. First mm. night in, and I got a bloody nose. The first night, my nose used to bleed quite a bit, but um, so after that, you know, it was sparring the whole way. You know, it was probably not as much learning as there should have been, but it was it was fun. There was rounds every night, and there was always someone going home crying. It was a tough education. It was a tough <laughs> education. And probably not, you know, um, you you learn more about fighting necessarily than the, the, the basics, so you had to go back and learn them at a later stage, which isn't the best way to, to learn boxing. And do you remember your first fight? I remember, I'm, I had, you know, I, I had a load of fights, you know. I suppose I started boxing when I was seven years of age, six years of age. So, you know, I had all these fights. They were unofficial fights, you know. You um, you weren't meant to win or lose, but, you know, you usually you, you did win all the time anyway. But I remember um, when I was 10 years of age going to Wexford for a, for a fight. Um, and we got down to Wexford. We were our club was South Mead. It was a great club. Seamus McDonough actually was from was from there, and you know it was it was a great club. We went down a little mini bus to Wexford, and um, when we got down there, there was no fight. I had no fight, and I was absolutely devastated. But there was this kid who was twelve years old, and he was he you know ten and twelve. There's a big age difference, and he was also five kilos heavier than me. And I said, look, I want to fight him, and the guy said, no, you know this guy is after winning the Wexfords, he's after winning the Leinsters, he's going into the Boy 2 All-Irelands, you know, and he's a hopeful, he got Leinster boxing, Boxer of the Year. I says, I still want to fight him, you know. He was there, I remember it to this day, I, I was there with me, me, um, me jeans, and they had this green detail, the pockets stitched in, no back pockets, and he had a pair of jeans with back pockets and all. <laughs> he had one of these varsity tops, it was black with some, you know, some letter, we'll say it's W for Wexford, and the white sleeves, and he had a girlfriend at 12, this blonde girlfriend <laughs> with curly hair. Oh, she looked like she was just out of a, a board B ad advertising <laughs> milk or something like that. <laughs> So anyway, they agreed. You hated him straight away. Most, you know, like if the girlfriend wasn't one reason enough, the jacket and the <laughs> jeans was two more reasons. So, so they agreed to fight, and his coach said, he said, I, we're going to stop this as soon as it gets out of hand at all because this is, you know, this this is ludicrous. And I was here just nodding my head, you know, thinking, yeah, well, they'll stop it all right. So anyway, um, the bell rang for the first round, and you know, I unleashed hell on this poor guy. And I know they rang the bell early after, you know, in the first round because I was hitting them with absolutely ever, everything. I think it went around 20 or 30 seconds into the second round and, and that was enough. I think that was that poor guy's boxing career over. I remember going back to my corner and kind of expecting the girl to be there with the jacket in her hand waiting for me. But, you know, um, you know she, she wasn't, you know. Yeah. I, um, I had to wait a couple of more years to get my first girlfriend, and <laughs> and and um, well, that's the thing. Like sometimes with boxing and with sport, you think that victory or winning or being successful kind of will complete the circle, or will kind of like you said, you think I thought the girl or that everything was going to be great, but it doesn't really. Does no, it? You know, I didn't get. I actually bought a jacket like yeah. it around <laughs> twenty years later, and I wore it once or twice. You know, it wasn't that jacket. So. <laughs> I, you want I, a twelve-year-old jacket? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I didn't want it, but, but, yeah. Um, I, I kind of knew then I was very strong, mm. and I, I could punch a bit, mm -hmm. and I was raw, and I wanted to win, and 
you know, uh, I suppose in boxing, if you want to win and you can punch, that's going to take you, uh, uh, you yeah. know, a little bit of the way anyway. Well, you went to the Europe as a junior, you went to the European Champions Chips and uh, gold medal. And me, as me growing up as a kid, um, I'd always hear about Cahill O'Grady, European champion. He went to the European Championship and won gold medal. And like, just to put it into context for people, like winning a European gold medal is a lot, a lot of the times harder than winning a gold medal in the worlds or a gold medal at the Olympics because you, you, every country you face in, Euro, in Europe, they're well educated, very good boxers, and it's a hard, it's probably the hardest medal to win. Well, it, it, you know, it was it was difficult at the time. You know, there wasn't a landscape of everyone winning medals. You know, left, right, and mm. center. You know, it was, um, that's why for me know. growing up, that was why it so, was like an out an out an outlier. Like this guy actually won the medal. Like so, it was, done. and it is still. Uh, you know, looking back, it was. I, I, the medal is probably somewhere in a drawer somewhere and I did I won four fights actually the, the person who won it the year before me that same medal was Klitschko mm. you know at, at the same weight as well whatever happened to him <laughs> after that I don't know where it all went downhill for him after he won that but you know so that's yeah. that's the you know that's the level and uh, you know it was four fights three of them inside the distance and um, a points win over a tough German, you know, and it was very, and it kind of launched me onto, I was only j just turned 18, and it launched me as a senior boxer, probably a little bit premature, but when, you know, I'd, I suppose I'd no, I, was, I'd no place left to go, only senior enough, at, 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 yeah. at 17, 18 enough, years of age. Enough kind of yeah. Thing, isn't it? yeah. And I'm, I'm sure at that stage people were signaling you as a future professional, but were you... Like, were you intent on going to the Olympics then? I was, you know, the Olympics was always something, you know, it was always, and it still is dangled as this huge big carrot, maybe, maybe wrongfully so as, you know, the be all and end all of, of amateur boxing and professional boxing. But for me, I am, um, you know, it was, it was something that I really wanted to go. I won that European Juniors in 95 and then entered the National Senior Championships in 1990. Um, 96 and I was just it was I won it two days after my 19th birthday the senior heavyweight title um, I beat Paul Douglas who'd gone to the quarterfinals in the Olympic Games before so uh, so you know um, what do you do if you're you know if you're if you win it you're you're ready to go and then it was off to the to the Olympic qualifiers and I scraped in and made it there, yeah. last man in. Amazing, but, yeah. yeah. What was that Olympics like on the team? You would have had Francie Barrett. Who else was there? Brian uh, McGee, Brian Damien McGee. Kelly. Yeah. So there was just four of us there, and I suppose um, it was it was it was an unusual time. Um, we trained in, in 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 Florida. I never sparred one amateur boxer mm. before the Olympic Games at all. I sparred Uriah Grant, world cruiserweight champion. I sparred Lenkoff Johnson, um, world light heavyweight professional champion, and um, I sparred a big Jackson guy um, who was just after doing eight rounds with Lennox Lewis as a professional heavyweight. You know, so you're battering at these guys. So it wasn't, it was in a, a gym in Miami, rough part of town, and it wasn't ideal preparation, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed sparring with those guys, you know, and I was was having a good bit of success so you know i it wasn't the correct preparation but it was my preparation and, and i made i made the most of it mm. and how long after the olympics like our immediate athletes were you thinking about turning pro i suppose just getting back to the olympics mm. you know first um i was thinking about going pro before the olympic games i yeah. had some offers you know some people came over to talk to me you know and they um you know and I probably should have focused on what was in front of me at the time as a 19-year-old fighter, you know, not be yeah. thinking about, you know, the um, the Olympic or anything past the Olympic Games. But um, well, in I, terms of being in Atlanta and the whole experience of the Olympics and the Olympics for me was, um, you know, was was a mixed bag. So I remember um, the week leading up to the Olympic Games, it was, um, you know. 
the secret was out that Muhammad Ali, one of my all-time idols, was going to light the Olympic flame. And you could not get a ticket for love nor money because at the time he was struggling badly with his Parkinson's and, you know, they were questioning whether he was actually going to be able to hold the, hold the Olympic torch steady enough to light this Olympic flag. I knew he was because I knew he was just, he was just playing possum and toying with the audience as well. But I weighed in on the Friday morning for the Olympic Games and the draw was made um, that day, which had me fighting when the Olympic Games opened on a Sunday morning. Olympic ceremony was that night, so I missed, you know, I had that ticket to see Muhammad Ali, but I wasn't willing to sacrifice my first fight in the Olympic Games for staying up running around some Olympic stadium half the night. You know, I, 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 I watched that from you know the Olympic Village uh, and I said I'll be ready come Sunday morning I had the exact same thing in 2004 that the, the same thing the open ceremony was the night and I had to fight the next day yeah. and it kind of took a while uh, I went to the closing ceremony and it was only then that it hit me that I was at the Olympics you know yeah. like well this is what it's about this is the yeah. feel like I walking do. around and seeing the crowd and all the, the camaraderie and, and the friendliness and I don't know, between the countries and then I realized, oh, this that's, is what it's all that's, about. That and is I, the, you yeah. know, the Olympic but, spirit about competing. Yeah, uh, that's what it's all about. And realistically, you know, they need to have the opening ceremony, at least two or three days clear mm-hmm. of competition that, 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 that everyone can go and, and, and let it be this great celebration of all the sports and all the countries in the world coming together. But we know that the Olympics isn't, yeah. you know... A hundred years on it was, I was in the Centennial Olympic Games and and the shit was getting darker and darker by the minute, so it was, yeah. you know. Uh, tell me about the boxing, the actual boxing at the Olympic Games. So, I suppose, you know, so Friday, the draw is, is made. So, I, I remember the weigh-in on Friday morning. I was boxing at 91 kilos and... Um, Were you weighing 91 around that Weighing time? bang on oh, 91, yeah. you, know, um, to, you know, on the button. I remember getting, uh, getting on the scales and Felix Yvonne was there beside me and he weighed exactly the same, you know, the same weight. Now, he was six inches taller, but no, he hadn't got a, he hadn't got a good pair of GA legs on him, <laughs> though, you know, those were skinny old yokes. <laughs> He'd be pushed off the ball if he was in full forward, so he would. But um, I, I drew a New Zealander, Garrett De Silvia, and, and that was a really good draw. The, you know, the guy could fight a little bit. He made it to the Olympic Games, but he was someone, he was someone that I, 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 could, I could definitely beat. And I was... So, Sunday morning, 12 o'clock, got into the ring. I'm out of the ring, you know, you know tr- getting dressed again by 10 past 12. I was up seven points to two and it all just went horribly wrong afterwards. And I remember just absolute devastation. Like there were people still arriving to the Olympic ceremony or or to the Olympic village to compete in the games and I'm out. And I remember going to, you know, this great food emporium that they've all the, the foods from every nation in the world. And I went over to the McDonald's, and I don't even like McDonald's. And I went and I said, give me a couple of, you know, Big Macs or some shit like that. And I sat down and ate them. And that was a real safe haven for losers. Yeah. You know, if you were sitting down eating McDonald's on the first day of the Olympic Games, things didn't go too well for you at the Olympic Games. So it, didn't. So it was, you know, and I suppose... Um, you think you would if you were drawn against... A more respected boxer, you would have had a different outcome. Do you think? Did you underestimate the New Zealand? Um, I didn't underestimate him. I got caught and I got beaten. Yeah. You know, so that's. I yeah. actually have the video of of the fight. A friend of mine works in RT, and I asked her, "Will you get me the video of the fight?" And she handed me a VHS because I never saw it. Mm. You know, so I said, "And you know what? I put that VHS in a drawer and I never watched it, and I might be missing out." on some overwhelming, cathartic experience. <laughs> you know, if I pull it out and stick it yeah. into a VHS player and watch the 100 seconds or whatever length that it lasted, but you know what? I'm willing to take that chance <laughs> and go on the way I am and forget about it, so I am, you know? Well, it's there, if you ever get the urge, isn't uh, it? Yeah, it know? is. If yeah. ever things get really bad and I need to feel worse about myself, it's always there, <laughs> so it is. But you never know. You probably you might have a different perspective. Um, Say that you I weren't suppo- doing so bad, you know. 
I know I was, you know, look, it's, you know, it's there, it's, you know, um, I suppose there is, uh, there is a learning experience if you're still fighting, you yeah, know what I mean, but yeah. I'm not fighting anymore, yeah. and, and now, looking back at the Olympic Games, I'm proud to have got there at 19 years of age, mm. disappointed that I didn't do that well, but still, you know, I've still a couple of Olympic tracksuits in a in in a cupboard somewhere. <laughs> yeah. and they're awful looking. Well, you never lose the title, you know. You know, so yeah. it is. It is. I don't. You know. Um. It's. You know. I'm. 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 I'm happy that I was there. Mm. Same as yourself, Andy. You were there, and it, you were beaten on a countback. Mm. You know. It promised so much. You know. But you know what? You draw a line under it and you move on. Exactly. Um. Yeah. In a lot of ways, it's it's built up to be this. The, the pinnacle and this great circus and when you get there you realise it's just like any other competition and that in some ways you can build it up to be more than it is yeah it, it is now it, it, you know I suppose it's the four year it only comes around four mm. years and if you if you mess it up you only really get one chance you know and I think you know even though you know the lads will talk about your likelihood of success is far greater in your second Olympic cycle um, than mm. your first. But, you know, those four years in between, and you mightn't even qualify with the way qualification has gone, and who knows, we mightn't even have boxing in the Olympic Games. Like, it's, it's two years away, and we haven't even sorted that out. So, like, yeah. you know, the whole Olympics and boxing, you know, isn't in a really pretty... It's, it's in a pretty bad place at the moment. Um, so how long at the Olympics was it that you turned professional? Um... I turned professional in 97, so Olympics mm. was over, you know, August 97, I t or August Six. 96, yeah. I turned pro in 97, yeah. in September 97. Mm. And um, I, t I trained, I'd gone over and trained with Eddie Futch for a while mm. and Tell Torrance over in Las Vegas, and Wayne McCullough was there at the time, who is one of my favourite fighters, and he's an incredible individual. He's, you know, go, you know, He's just a lovely guy, and he yeah. really looked out for me. I remember being over there. I, what I what I noticed, I, I was sparring over there, and I was sparring some heavyweight, and this guy was trying to take my head off, you know. And I remember at the time, um, Eddie Futch was in the corner, so the head, this big heavyweight was coming. He'd five and zero as a pro. I turned him in the corner, you know, hit him two or three shots, and like dropped him. He was out, mm. and I went over and I apologized. I says, "Look, Eddie," I says. Sorry about that, but he was acting the maggot there, you know. I, you know, it was me or him, and I was a good bit lighter than him, you know. And he said, "Don't ever apologise. That's your job." Yeah. And I, I remember getting in so much trouble in Dublin for knocking lads out, man. <laughs> and in England, then no one liked yeah. it. But over there, like he says, "That's your job." Was you know? there a story, man, locking out lads? Was there a story where you knocked out a, a cow or a horse? Oh. There it is. <laughs> so, but just you know, this you know. Um, <laughs> I, I, I was, we were growing up on the farm. We were dairy farmers, so we were milk, milking the cows anyway. So, this, um, so I was in milking the cows, and there was this one cow, and she used to always kick the arms. She'd kick you all over the place. You know, and I was, you know, I didn't want to be in there. I had to go somewhere else. And she kicked me, and, like, oh, I was, you know, it was really sore. And I, I'd, I'd been reading Roberto Duran's book where he knocked out a horse. So I said, it can't be too bad if I hit this cow a box. And I was a southpaw like yourself. So I remember hitting the cow a straight left hand into the body. And <laughs> down the body. into the body shot because I couldn't get near her head because I was down lower in the milking parlour. And she went down, down, dropped her on all fours. She was lying there in the milking parlour, wouldn't move. She, <laughs> she was, and I felt... I just felt really, really, really bad. So it's going to get a lot of uh, oh, a lot of stick. But yeah. I, I felt, you know, I I, I, I had a moment. <laughs> but um, you know, she kicked me first. Though you have to remember, this was self defence. But she was lying there on, you know, and I said, I felt really bad. I said, what a bully! You're a horrible individual. And eventually, she got onto her feet, and I let her out. And um, I just that night, I I couldn't stop thinking about her. I says, you know. And I woke up the next morning, and my father's in bad humour. And um, he says, there's a cow dead up the field. I says, oh, no. I says, not only did I drop her, she's dead. You know, there must be some internal bleeding. And I was going to tell him, 
you know, but I decided not to because the cow then, this is back in 93, 94, this cow was probably worth around 1,200 pounds, you know, like it, this is a valuable piece of cow, you know, so I said, I, I'll say nothing. But anyway, so we had to go and get the cow, so we go up, <laughs> and it's some other cow that's after dying. It isn't the cow that I ate at all. So it was, so, you know, it was, because um, I had contemplating going to be a vegan and everything that night you know this was after hitting the cow I felt so bad I said I'm not going to eat meat or drink milk or anything that and this was when it wasn't even cool to be a vegan back in 93 no one even knew what one was but um <laughs> but uh, but it was it was another cow so I'd, I'd say it was some sort of acute post-traumatic stress disorder witnessing me hit the other cow you know to trigger the cardiac arrest or something like that but no you know that it was um you know, it was definitely, and you know, Roberto Duran must have felt like shit after knocking out that horse as well. <laughs> I doubt he uh, he uh, lost any sleep. No, definitely like not. Tell me this: so, as a pro, you trained with some of the the best trainers in the game at that stage. Kevin Rooney, you mentioned Eddie Futch, a bit with Freddie Roach. Yeah. What was it like working with those guys? It was it was it was great. You know, um, but I probably didn't get, you know, um, you know. I probably didn't, you know, the gr the greatest trainer in the world is this is someone that you gel with, and uh, you know, and you you had that experience. You were lucky enough to have the greatest trainer in the world, and for him to gel with you. And you trained with Emmanuel Stewart for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I tra I trained with Emmanuel. I, you know, I thought Emmanuel was just a phen phenomenal trainer, but it's someone that that understands you and can watch your development and watch 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 your mistakes. And you know, and 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 try and build a career, you know, from and and work on your strengths. So I I finished my career um, with 18 professional fights, 16 16 wins, two losses. I think 14 of them were inside the distance of the of the wins as well, you know. And just about how the end of your career came about, um, you failed a, a brain scan. I failed. Was it so it, it was a routine MRA. You know, so it was a new requirement of the British Boxing Board of Con to Control to have this MRA, which looks more at the vascular anatomy, looks at the blood supply to and from the brain, whereas the MRI looks at, you know, it's um, more, you know, the soft tissue. So it was found that I had a, a, I was missing a major blood vessel, my left vertebral artery. So they were worried if you suffered a, a severe rotational injury after a, a shot, that um, that the blood supply, to, you know, to your posterior lobe, might be compensated, and uh, and that would be, you know, that, that'd be a stroke or something like that. So that was it. Don't, was it something that was it. always there, or something that developed? It was something that was always there. To think, you know, to think it was a congenital thing. Well, it could have, it could have developed, but you know, yeah. uh, um, the one, the other one, the right one that I had was a good big fat one supplying <laughs> me with plenty of blood, but. Um, and that's fine. And there could be loads of people going around with like this on day to day. But when you're at a an at risk game like boxing, where you know these things are are, are put on the line, you know, um, they said mm. no way. How old were you at that stage? I was just turned twenty four. So um, it was. So I was. Um, I think I had my last fight when I was twenty three. I was just turned twenty four, which was very young. Mm. You know, especially I was a cruiserweight then. You know, so uh, only only just maturing, and it's hard. You know, it's hard. It's a hard one to take because, for you know, I started boxing as I said at six, so twenty four. So your whole identity is you know wrapped up in being this boxer, being this fighter, and then all of a sudden, with a stroke of a pen, your license is gone. So you know, you're you know people say, oh, you're the boxer, when well, you're yeah, well, I'm actually not anymore. I'm mm. you know. I'm the ex-boxer, and, and and I suppose you struggled with that, and then um, you struggle with your, you know, you wrestle with it for a good while, you know, um, especially when you're 24 and you're kind of in your prime, and you you turn on Sky Sports and some bum that you dropped in the gym is making a lot of money, you know that, you know, it, it does hurt, you mm -hmm. know, a little bit, but you know, then you put things in perspective, you know. Um, 
there is a chance that some some awful could have happened. That you could have been left in a in like these guys weren't telling us telling you this. To, you know, they weren't taking your boxing license away just to be assholes. They were you know doing yeah. it for your best interest. You know, and I had. How long did it take to? I uh, know you would have took a while to come to that realization. Of I am. Did it, it, or no? it, it did. It did take you know, and then you know, especially. Until everyone that I ever bet was gone. <laughs> I, know, I know, it was, uh, you know, I, I suppose um, it, 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 it took a while, but, you know, um, outside of boxing, you know, I had a beautiful wife. Well, she wasn't my wife till a little bit after, you know. I've now four kids, mm. you know, so... You can't, you know, you, yeah, you look, can't, you, well, you know, back, I suppose, you know, look, you know, easy, you, it is. I'm sure, it was very. It hard, was, it was know. difficult, and and the promise of 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 riches beyond your wildest dream, and to make a lot of money, and that was, you know, you were left, you know, without a career, you know, without an well, income source, yeah, without a livelihood, a couple of shitty stories that you know <laughs> that you can pedal for you know getting you know for a few years but no that's mm. you know that's what you what you're left with but that's mm. so that's what, did you, what did you do what, what what did you find yourself doing did you go back to the farm did you I went back the father threw me out i know <laughs> he, he, he found out about the cow yeah yeah <laughs> well, she was still waiting there to kick me and would you believe it any time I ever milked a cow, she would never give me a drop of milk. You know, the trust was gone between me and her. So she'd come in and it'd be like she just turned the other way and not one, yeah. one milliliter of milk would she give me. But anyway, getting back to it, I suppose um, I still love boxing. Mm. So I, I said, okay, I didn't, you know, have a university degree or I didn't, you know, have this, but I, you know... I did actually go and work construction for a while with, with the guys, and I remember a funny story. Um, so the lads called to my house, and they, you know, I suppose your friends, I do, you know, a couple of great friends, and you know, they were not worried. You know, they're just saying, you know, he needs a lift. So I remember the guys. Um, Michael McGuire is the guy. This guy is a he's 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 a card. He called to me house, and he said, he says, come on, I have a job for you in the local hotel. He says, you know. Um, he says, it's 120 quid a day, which was a good, you know, this was back in 2001, which was a lot of money. And I thought they were doing some dry lining or some like, some simple enough. So anyway, we walked in the door of the hotel anyway, and he says, if anyone asks you, you're a, you're a, a, a finished carpenter. I says, I oh, know, Michael, you're not doing this to me, you know. So he says, just stay with me, you'll be fine, you know. And he wasn't even the carpenter, but he was a good bluffer. <laughs> so anyway... I walk in the door. I didn't really care. I was just laughing, and um, and I was still like fit and strong from boxing. And it was in the middle of the summer. I had a short sleeve shirt on, and this guy separated us. And um, you know, he he wanted Michael to do some job, and he asked me to do another job. And I had no tools or anything. <laughs> and he says, "Come over here, you." And I just looking at him, and he says, "I want you to hang a few doors." You know, he says, they're the big heavy fire doors. How would you be with that? I says, 100%, no problem. I'll hang your fire doors, all right. That's that's no problem. And so I walked. I had no tools, so I actually robbed. There was an electrician there, robbed some of his tools just to have something in my hand. And, like, he's looking at the tools. And, and he goes over to me and he says, um, he says, would you have hung many doors, you know, before? I said, well, if I get this one up, it'll be me first. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and then we had a, you know, we, you know, he, he found, you know, in fairness to them, they found jobs suitable for my <laughs> skill set, <laughs> which probably revolved around uh, driving a dumper or making tea or something like that for a while. But um, I, I enjoy, you know, I enjoyed the banter that, you know, with yeah. the lads and, and it was great. The hotel went bust. The whole building went bust a couple of a couple of weeks later, though. So maybe I some partly responsible for that as well <laughs> by not getting those doors up. Um, but what, I guess when I met you, you came. It was at the start of the high performance. That was the first time I met yeah. you. You would have only been around twenty six then, was it? So it wasn't. That I was. Long. I was only. I was young, and I was probably too young to be a coach. Yeah. Even though I had so much to give, you know. Um, and Gary Keegan interviewed me and he you know he 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 wanted some of the passion i was at the olympic games i had i had i had a major medal at a mm. at a at a at an amateur tournament and they, there wasn't too many no. of them around then it's not like now everyone wins you know so um so he brought me in 
and I worked as a high performance coach for two, two and a half years with Gary and with Billy and with Zor. And I, it's a time I thoroughly enjoyed, but I also learned that I didn't want to be a high performance coach. Mm. You know, maybe I was selfish. I didn't want to go around the world chasing someone else's dream because I suppose I never got a chance to, you know, fully chase my own. You know, maybe, maybe if I went into it a little bit later, but it was it was great crack, and you know this is where I met yourself, Andy, and um, you know that time in Finland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell us about it. <laughs> you were signed as the only coach. Yeah, the only coach. You're only how old? You're 26 yourself. 26, and, and they give those, me those lads on the team probably yeah. older than you. There, yeah, I think the you time. know there was a similar age, and <laughs> they give me Andy Lee, who isn't too bad. To give me James Moore, you know James, you know, but to give me Donovan and Sheehan as well, two of the biggest messers, you know, the two greatest lads, Eric and Roy, Eric and Roy over there, and this this was just a training camp, so there was no fight, so it was just a kind of a bit of a, a blowout. And so they had to spar the um, Finnish and Norwegian team every day who were rubbish. So you did it, you know, um, uh, no disrespect, but you guys were a, a hell of a lot better. But I remember lying there in, I was lying in the bed and the, the, the um, Finnish coach who was a guy called Essa, a true gentleman, the boys actually, you know, robbed him blind playing cards every night <laughs> as well. But he knocks on my door and... Um, he, you know, I remember a knock on the door and he comes in, peeps in, he said, he says, how are you? I says, good. He says, the lifeboat is missing. And I said, because we're in a, a lake district, you know, up, you know, and uh, it was on like a lake. And I said, yeah, like, uh, so what? What's the problem? So are Donovan and Sheehan. Oh, I said, okay, I see why you're coming to me. <coughs> Donovan and Sheehan sold the lifeboat. That's, that's <laughs> what happened, isn't it? And um, so anyway, I go out. Here on this lake, it's freezing, minus some are Donovan and she and Donovan has a snow shovel and he's paddling with that and um, and Sheehan has a broken oar and and the two boys, this is a little narrow thing to go extremely fast, but um they weren't coming in, so um I don't know, I, we got yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we had some good plan. That we, you know, the only way to get them in was to to go after I them think ourselves. We really just wanted to get <laughs> yeah. on the lake, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I remember there was myself and who yourself and James Moore as well. But um, I think he's got me in the water <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So we ni- we, we nearly needed that lifeboat. Yeah. It, w- it was it was good fun. Yeah, so it was and and, times. and I suppose. You've got your world titles, you've got so many titles, but, uh, you know, you look back at days like that, you know, yeah. trying to chase after Donovan and Sheehan in a lifeboat and you laugh and you say, like, these are the memories, yeah, the, 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 you know, that, um, the, you know, that of, the, of the good old days, aren't they, you know? Yeah. Um, and moving away from that, you were the first person, I know white collar boxing was big for a long time, still is, and was a real buzz, but you were the first person to ever bring white collar boxing to Ireland. Yeah, it was, so when I finished as a high performance coach, I had this idea of, of bringing white collar boxing to Ireland and people, people thought I was, a ma- was mad initially. So that's 13 years ago, 2005. And even though you're training people who, you know, who've no boxing experience, um, you know, who are never going to be, you know, any good per se. Like, they're never going to box in national championships or they're never going to box at Olympic Games or anything like that. But I really, really enjoyed it. And I met so many amazing people because everyone is fighting some sort of fight in their life, you know, um, be it overcoming whatever, you know. And, and for them to come in and just... Uh, come into our boxing gym, this one here where we have going now down in Harold's Cross, and to just um, to forget about what's going on um, in their life, you know, or in their workplace, and throw off the trappings of bureaucratic life, and just go and, and hit a punch bag for or, or climb into a ring and spar or do the pads or do some of the technical work or and have a good old workout you know because you know the exercise is you know exercise 
is so underrated for everything, for mental health, for physical health, for everything. And that's, it's just another form of exercise and the amount of people we have, and we've had the best shows. We put on some big events in the Mansion House, you know, uh, you know, in New York, you know, in Belfast, in the Europa Hotel. And they've been absolutely amazing. And, and I have guys that are here, you know, to come, they're, they're here the last couple of years. There's one guy who comes here and I says, did you know that you started boxing before Anthony Joshua? <laughs> <laughs> I says, and look at how bad you are still, you know. But he just laughs at it because, you know, it's, um, he's actually here with me longer than the, Anthony Joshua is boxing. But, um, but you know, the, no one, you don't have to be a champion, do you? You know, yeah. uh, you know yeah. there, there's, something, there's something here for everyone, so mm. there is. Yeah. Um, and in terms of yourself and on a personal level, um, something that you've overcome recently, um, in 2016 you were diagnosed with cancer. What was that like for you as being the man that you are, big, strong, you know? I suppose, I remember at the time... Um, it was, the, well, what I said was, in boxing, the punch that you don't see coming is the one that does all the damage, and you know that, you know. Kabarov didn't see that one, you know, coming, or, you know, uh, it's, it's, um, and just out of the blue, um, I was at the dentist, and she found a lump in my mouth, and she sent me to the dental hospital for, you know, for them to have further, I thought, absolutely nothing of it, and, um, so I went in there one Monday morning and there was a consultant from St. James's waiting there, you know, and he says, look, you've got, you know, um, that lump, you know, we'd they done a biopsy on it a couple of days earlier. And I didn't even even know, like, biopsy is kind of cancerous, you know, so, but you should be kind of thinking, but I didn't think of anything. And I walked in there and, um, and I did, like, I got, you know, a big bang out of the blue. So it is, you know... Um, Initially, it's a huge shock. And initially, your mind, you know, Emmanuel, or uh, Customato, the great trainer, you know, he, he says your mind is not your friend. And uh, when you're diagnosed with cancer, initially, your mind isn't your friend because it starts running away saying, oh, you know, and every lump that you ever had, and, you know, it could spread here or it could spread there or I'm dead or, you know, all, all, the, all, the, all these things, you know, um, went, went through your head. Until this, until, um, until you're dealing with facts, so, you know. So um, it's best to deal with facts, and it's best to deal with your facts as well, you know. So, and my facts were, you know, you have a salivary gland cancer, you know, it's curable, you know. And what you're going to need is you're going to need surgery, you know, to cut out the lump. Um, so I, mine was in my the the roof of my mouth, my palate. So I had to have um, what's called a, a palatectomy and a maxillectomy. So I had to take some of my maxilla here and, and, and um, some of the palate, my soft palate and hard palate on the roof of my mouth, um, cut it out and um, then they send, the, you know, they send what they cut out for pathology to see, you know, if there's any residual cells, you know, um, in the, in the, in the, um, the outer area, um, which there was, you know, so it had spread into, it was local bone and perineural invasion, it's called, so just locally it had, it had spread a bit. So then um, the next stage of treatment was, um, was radiotherapy. You know, and that, no, that was in St. Luke's Hospital, but I remember walking in the door of St. Luke's Hospital, and, um, and that was when it hit home to me that, you know, uh, and I suppose it closed the book on my boxing career as well. I walked in the door, and I remember going in the first time, you know, because everyone in St. Luke's Hospital is in there because of cancer. It's a cancer hospital, so you know they're either recovering from it, they're getting tested for it, they're getting treatment for it. So I remember walking in the door and you know seeing a couple of kids with you know with the hair gone, little bandanas, and I, you know, here's this big you know brute of a a, a boxer, and he's afraid. He's you know I'm 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 petrified, and I don't want to make eye contact. I'm looking down, you know, at the floor, not just not want to look at them and. And then I remember sitting, um, sitting down in the waiting room and then thinking, do you know what? 
these are my people, you know, now because I'm going through, you know, a, um, a cancer treatment. And you know what? You want to see fighters? You go to St. Luke's Hospital and you see that four-year-old co kid that's playing, you know, and, and who's fighting all sorts of adversity. You see his mum and his dad who's travelling up and down. Or you see, you know, you see the old man who's like... 90 years of age and is still you know he's st you know he still feels like he's got a lot more to give in life that he isn't just giving up he's 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 fighting on so i'm you know so i had 33 visits there 33 sessions that's how long my radiotherapy lasted so what they do is you know they to kind of burn away you know the the cancer cells you know and um so like it was, you know, it's tough, it's tough going. But it was something that you kind of, you went through on your own because it wasn't until even you were cured that you were t telling people about or that it happened. It wasn't something that you, you know, I, I, did you, you feel know what? like you had to keep it yourself or that you wanted to or? It just, you know, like it? it's, it's not something, you know, you go around saying, but there was a, um, they asked me in the dental hospital to do a kind of a, uh, a mouth cancer help out with ma mouth cancer awareness there, you know because um, if people a lot of a lot of times people your mouth is some place that falls in between a dentist and a doctor to look at you know so people should you know go to the dentist yearly or every second year and you know or the doctor and just get the there's an awful lot of tissue in there just get it checked. And if there's, you know, if there's anything that's bothering you and, uh, and like prevention is, is so much better than cure in this area. So the, um, Denise McCarthy, who's, who's the head of the, um, you know, the, you know, mouth cancer awareness in Ireland, she says, um, will you do, will you help us out with mouth cancer awareness? Say, will you do a, a bit of a talk and um, will you, you will, will, will we share your story? And, um, you know, if it was going to help someone, you know, if my story, however, you know, um, boring or whatever it was, was going to make someone go and get a lump or something, investigate it. So that's, you know, so we done done, done that. And I, and I really, you know, and then when I, when I went and done that, I felt like, okay, I can't let anyone down here, you know. So, um, and I, you know, it was something I was glad, glad that I'd, I, I done, you know, um, I was really glad. Cancer is horrible. It's not, you know, it's not nice. But there are some lessons to be learned as well. I suppose I'm a father of four kids and I'm a husband. I probably got a lot closer. You know, my wife and kids were very good. You know, my wife is a nurse, you know, and, and very supportive. And it's all I have to do is turn up and do the treatment, you know, and get up the next day. You know, it's the people who are, you know, the partners or kids. They're the ones that, you know, uh, have the, the more difficult time. You know, I, you know, I, I just turned up and, and went and done it and, um, and then crossed that one off the list. OK, I have to go again tomorrow and the next day. But, um, you know, so it is, you know, so... Um, it can bring people closer together, and that's that's a good thing, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, I guess it is. Yeah. In the end, even like something good came out of bad. Yeah, you know, you have to pull positives from 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 these things, you know. And I suppose that that was the positives. And um, and do you know what? It, you know, and and going back to um, that struggle that I had back when I was twenty four years of age, when people asked me, Carl O'Grady. Are you the fighter? And I, you know, and 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 I didn't know or not. I, you know, I, I, I my face went blank because I didn't have the answer to that question or not. But I do now because I got it in St. Luke's Hospital, and I am a fighter. And so are every one of those kids who walk in the door. I know anyone, you know, who 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 battles, you know, the disease in whatever form they have it, you know. So. I'm still a fighter, 42 years of age. Still, going still a strong. fighter. Still probably knock a few fellas out and a few cows. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I haven't had a cow since. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, that's all from us this morning on OTBM. But before we go, we have to bring you the winner of our brilliant competition we've been running here all week. With thanks to Turkish Airlines, proud sponsors of Cricket Ireland, we've been giving one lucky OTBM viewer the chance to fly anywhere in the world with Turkish Airlines ahead of a cracking summer of cricket for Ireland as they host some of the biggest teams in the world. And we have our winner. Congratulations to John Carswell. And just a reminder that on May 3rd, the Ireland men's team will face England in Malahide with a tri-series against Bangladesh and West Indies to follow. It's one of the busiest summers ever in Irish cricket, so keep an eye on all of that. Uh, that is all we have time for this morning. We have lots coming up across off-the-ball platforms over the weekend. Tomorrow, live commentary of Saracens against Munster in the Champions Cup semi-final from Coventry. And we also have Everton against Manchester United on Sunday, as well as Cardiff versus Liverpool, live from 1pm on News Talk on both Saturday and Sunday. Tomorrow as well on Today FM, you can hear live commentary of Man City against Spurs in the Premier League. That'll be live online on todayfm.com forward slash PLL from 12.15pm and then from the radio show at 2 o'clock on the FM you can hear live commentary of West Ham against Leicester City that'll all be with Philip Egan tomorrow afternoon. Off the Ball is back from 7 o'clock tonight. Until then, see ya.